So, um, Mr. James Mann, very nice to see you, uh, that you were able to join us. Please follow the regulations. Mute yourself when you are not speaking. Thank you very much. We are still accepting more people to join before we begin. So, we are not at full capacity yet, but we will be, uh, hopefully in some few minutes, and then we can join and we can start, thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the maiden edition of the Africa Digitization Conference on Tourism and Trade. I'm your host for the day and moderator, Angela Ekuya Asante, aka Triple A, COO at the Chamber for Tourism Industry Ghana. We are live streaming on YouTube and we are here on Google Meet. We are proud to be with people from Ladies all over the world. And this is what we are about to do. We're about to have a fantastic discussion on tourism and trade in Africa. It's going to be massive. We have people from all over the world joining in. More people joining us right now as I speak. So we're going to go now over to our CEO, Mr. Prince Intiama Bwapong, who is about to give us a very nice short uh, address to welcome us all. Remember that we are streaming live from the National Development Planning Commission in Accra, Ghana. We thank them for this gesture and we are streaming also with the support of our dear, our partners and sponsors, Santa Petroleum, Ridge Royal Hotel and Red Mango Hotel. So Mr. Prince, the floor is yours for your welcome address. Please unmute your microphone and let's take it away. Three minutes, top six. Address to welcome our Let me please ask everyone who is not talking to please um, mute their microphones because uh, this is not going to go well otherwise. We don't want to hear any echoes. I'm, I'm currently hearing myself on somebody's microphone, so please everyone mute your microphones. Thank you very much. So it's time now for uh, our CEO, Mr. Prince, to take the floor. Mr. Prince, can you hear us? Are you online? Yes, I'm online. I can hear you very well. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for our viewers and listeners all over the world. This is ACOT, the African Digitization Conference on Tourism and Trade. Issues of trade and tourism is a major issue when we come right, for discussion any day. In Africa, we are boasting of a population of about one point, around 1.3 billion people with a GDP of we are looking at a GDP of about 36.2 trillion, uh, 2.3 trillion, and an international yeah, trade volume of 36.2 like billion in 2016. So as a continent, we have a lot, when we want to concentrate on trade and tourism yeah. that we can do. Among ourselves, between the 29 Francophone countries and the 24 English countries that we are here in Africa, Trade among ourselves, as in um, the recent statistics, was just about 17%. Whilst other free trade areas, like the North African tree, uh, free trade area, is doing um, a little over, um, they are doing about 59%. We are doing about 17 So we are the least when it comes to trading among ourselves. And this population that we have, about 1.2 billion people, there's more we can do when it comes to trade and when it comes to tourism. The people arriving in Africa, we just had international arrivals, a volume in dollars about billion. And our African GDP is about two point something trillion. So it means that their contribution is very small and we can increase it. So conferences like African Digitization Conference on Tourism and Trade, we want to look at how even in COVID crisis situation like COVID, we still can boost tourism and ability to bring trade in it. Whilst tourism, we are talking about tourism and trade is that everywhere people go, the economies of the place change because they eat, they take transport, they sleep in hotels. So there is an aspect of business that goes on when people move. So as a tourism organization, we, we thought it very wise that we cannot talk about tourism in isolation without bringing the trade bits to it. 
countries in the United uh, Arab Emirates, the uh, EUA, that's Dubai, saw the future that their oil reserves will be running out. They replace it comfortably with tourism because as we live, as people work, there's always a need for people to travel. There's always a need for people to seek leisure and all. And so far as people will continue to do it, there will always be a business of tourism. There will always be a business of trade. Tourism cuts across everything. We have, we have sports tourism. We have agro-tourism. We have so many tourism. People travel for so many reasons. So as a continent, we are leading this conversation and saying that, listen, Africa, we can do well among ourselves. We can do well internationally. Welcome the global community to come and see the good things in Africa. Of course, always the, the thing or the catch for African tourism has been our beautiful tourist sites. But there are so many things that we can even explore further to bring people in for them to come and have an experience. Everything tourism, to me, is not even the cost of it, but it's about the value people will take in the form of experience that they will have. So as a continent, this is what we should be looking at. And the reason why we are bringing the technology bit is that technology is driving everything now. You can't do tourism now in isolation without being driven by a tour, uh, technology. So we look at a site like bookings.com that has come to, I mean, it's a tourism platform, but it's helping tourism time. And that's a conversation we want to advance this morning. So we have various speakers all over the world. We welcome all of you, the various organizations from African Union, NDPC, um, Ministry of Tourism, Ghana, GTA, uh, African Open Data, all the organizations that are represented in this conference. We are very happy to have all of you. The conversation will be very brief, but it's going to be very beneficial. Wherever you are around the world, welcome to the Made in Edition, and we'll be making it bigger by the grace of God. We'll be moving forward with a court, and it's going to be a platform that every year we're looking forward to be on it. God bless all of us, everybody who is here this morning, joining friends from the nations of the world, you have something to take home. Everybody who comes here and know is going to be something time. You are watching a live edition of the ADCOS, which stands for the African Digitalization Conference on Tourism and Trade. We have more and more people going into uh, Africa and so many other people from around the world are very privileged for that. Um, a short uh, thank you note to Dr. Kojo Isem Mensa Abrampa, Director General at the NDPC, where we are streaming this live today. We're going to quickly head over to Nigeria, where we have uh, Madam Abigail Adesina Olagbaye, African Tourism Board Ambassador and ex Miss Tourism Nigeria, for her solidarity message uh, on behalf of the African Tourism Board. Um, Abigail, can you please hear us? If you do, please unmute yourself and take the floor for your address. Hi, Abigail. Hello, Abby. Can you hear us? Can you unmute yourself? Yes, I have done that. Good morning. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Abigail, as uh, stated. Uh, Abigail Deshina Olagbaye. Um, I bring greetings, greetings from Nigeria, uh, the largest black nation in the world, uh, and uh, of course, um, with a broad spectrum of um, culture and tourism diversities. I serve the African Tourism Board as uh, the ambassador and country representative to Nigeria. I also uh, serve in a capacity as the chairperson for technology, innovation, and travel facilitation. And um, in this committee, we, um, in, of course, in collaboration with our partners, we, um, you know, design and advocate to design and, uh, you know, implement um, solutions 
you know, that uh, make uh, travel to and within Africa safe, uh, secure, and sustainable. So thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, I want to title my solidarity message, uh, Globalization of Africa's Tourism and the Symbiosis of Trade and Tourism. In definitive terms, the globalization of Africa's tourism means the widening of linkages and connectivity of places, uh, destinations, and products. The internationalization of Africa's tourism to make it known, accessible, experienced globally, and real time for more global tourism flows and business competition. We can make this possible through digitization, and it's already happening. What this means is that we must begin to identify and our differentiation assets, our culture and tourism repositories, open them up, study them clinically, determine their intrinsic features and values, and with that knowledge, package them as brands and products and make them available and accessible digitally for increase in global flow of tourists to Africa and within Africa. The world is moving and we don't want to be left behind as a continent. We must therefore earnestly afford ourselves an advantage that new technologies like um, data analytics, robotics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, internet of things, blockchain tech, tech virtual and augmented reality coding, 3D printing, uh, the list goes on. We must avail ourselves the opportunities that these new technologies provide us and digitize our culture and tourism assets to be able to grant and open up access technology to ourselves as Africans within and outside the continent, because of course we have our Africans in diaspora, and to tourists at our source markets without inhibitions or impediments of time, space, medium, or distance. This is important for the strategic positioning of um, Africa in terms of Africa's essence, uh, perception, and for strong global presence, relevance, res resilience, and economic and developmental prospects that come with us. We must now equip ourselves and diversify our cap capabilities with these digital and innovative skills, especially because the future of work may present the reality of greater loss of jobs. Who knows if robotics, uh, if robots rather, may become our tour guides eventually, with um, 3D printed buildings, event centers, hospitality facilities, and that at faster deliverable timelines. So I'm not talking of the future. These things are already happening, as I said. Therefore, it is a call and reminder to African countries, governments, and human agencies, public and private sectors, to come with collaborative action and synergies that culminate in solutions that best serve these purposes to facilitate knowledge transfer, offer training, digital and innovative skills, learning to young businesses, to youth in Africa, to women, and to other inclusive groups that operate in this space. Now, the volume of trade will increase on the continent, especially with the advent of our Africa continental free trade area, which um, commences in January 2021. So people will be traveling the length and breadth of Africa. So we must therefore think safety. We must think security. We must think sustainability and begin to determine the important place, role and significance that tourism um, holds and how it serves the, um, Africa's trade agenda. We are saying, as we trade, can we strategically in integrate tourism in the big trade sector? For instance, how many tourism service providers, organizations, and agencies are offering tour packages and experiences to chambers of commerce and industry, trade and professional organizations and associations? Let's get into the various business and professional sectors like mining, agriculture, finance, ins insurance, construction, medicine, commodities. FMCG, that fast-moving consumer goods. Let's get into these sectors and do a needs analysis, custom our tourism experience, experiences and products to suit consumer needs and go ahead and sell our destinations to these target groups. Finally, we have to bring the prospects, progress, and profits of trade to bear on tourism in terms of investment. If we don't develop tourism with the proceeds of trade, we will wake up one morning 
and discover we have not built anything. And that is a recipe for disaster. For the simple fact that business, businesses and markets are dynamic, hence, in the time of plenty, we must convert our wealth to meaningful, sustainable, real and lasting development. Also, I want to speak to businesses. Businesses who trade must be socially responsible in the environment and the communities and localities where they operate in terms of their positive or negative impact as the case may be. If your operations is causing damage to the environment and the people, you must appraise your production processes, business activities, and waste generated and retrace your steps as a business. Our culture and heritage must be protected. So businesses, corporations, multinationals, companies, um, ETC must, as a matter of urgency, invest in and develop the environment and the tourism assets that are raw and undeveloped that are in the destinations and the communities where they operate as a business. They must invest in the people. This is how to have a balanced, symbiotic, and complementary relationship between trade and tourism sustainably. This will take us as a continent closer to the AU Agenda 2063, the SDGs 2030 in Africa, and even our personal goals of living sustainably with the future generation in mind. So I, I'm rounding up by saying that more tourism, more trade, more trade gives birth to even more tourism, but it must be sustainable. So Africa Digitization Conference and Trade and Tourism at Cut keep this fire burning. African Tourism Board is happy to identify with this noble initiative and event. And to Africa, we say, welcome to the future. The future is now. Let's utilize digitization to capture and seize this future without further ado. It is not just for us, but also for those coming after us. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so, so very much, uh, Madam Abigail Olagbaye, former Miss Tourism um, Nigeria and ambassador uh, representing her country, Nigeria, at the African Tourism Board. Uh, such a passionate solidarity message. Um, I believe you said it all. Um, the chairman, Mr. In Kube from South Africa, uh, unfortunately, he couldn't make it uh, live uh, right now this morning. Uh, he did send a video, but you know, time is running out already. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to head over uh, our very own Mr. Kwesi um, Ayuson, uh, Vice um, President um, at, at Gatov and uh, President of the Tour Operations Unions of Ghana, Tuga. Um, it's very nice to have you online. Uh, if you are around, uh, please unmute yourself and take the floor. You online indeed, Mr. Kwesi Ayuson. Please unmute yourself and share with us a very brief solidarity messages. Your microphone is off. Please unmute yourself. There is a button at the at the end of your screen, at the bottom of your screen for the microphone. So please unmute your microphone and share your address. Let us know if you are facing any challenges to unmute yourself. You will see a microphone icon. You can turn, in, turn it off or on. But it looks like uh, Mr. Kwesi Ayuson is uh, having issues to join in. Uh, we can see his face clearly, but the sound is not coming. So, um, Mr. Kwesi, it's indeed a pleasure to have you. Uh, we will try and get back to you, uh, if time per permits, uh, a little bit later, uh, when you are able to fix your microphone issues. Uh, what we're going to do right now is, as we're catching up with time, we're going to head over Turkey. So we cannot hear you. We are going to have Mr. Bulut Bakshi, President uh, at the World Tourism Forum Institute and Global Tourism Forum. He's joining us all the way from Turkey. 
and he is going to share a fantastic address on tourism, education, investment, and marketing to adhere to international standard in the hospitality sector. Mr. Bulut Bakshi has a vast range you know, of experience in the tourism sector, uh, more than 10 years, and he is indeed the best person today to lecture us on tourism education, investment, marketing to adhere to international standards in the hospitality sector. Uh, Mr. Boot, are Hello, you on? Do you hear me? You are perfect. So we're going to yeah. have you. We're going to have yes, you. What time is it in Turkey? Actually, thank you very much uh, for hosting us on this. Uh, I mean, the perfect meeting, perfect webinar. So because the Ghana is my first place that I have touched and did an event in Africa the first time. I mean, in my first uh, place that I did the event. So uh, that's why Ghana has a special. Uh, I mean, the feelings for me, uh, when I feel, uh, when I heard the Ghana, so I feel very different than the other countries. Fantastic. Thank you very much again. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the pandemic, the coronavirus, uh, yes, it's a huge problem in the world, but the thing is, on tourism industry, if there is a crisis, there is another opportunity. So, on the World Tourism Forum Institute, we are looking and searching what is the opportunities. Uh, and basically, what we see uh, in all crises the world is faced, I mean, the 2001, 2007, 2011, United States, Europe, and the, uh, Asia, so all these countries face some crisis, maybe terrorism, maybe, I mean, again, the virus, or maybe economical problems. Uh, but the thing is, when the, when the, when the problem finishes, after then, the number of tourists doubles or 0.5 in, uh, i mean 1.5 increase so it's it's very important after this virus so the ghana tourism i mean the all the all the countries and all the regions tourism will increase but the thing is the most important here is uh after the crisis the people will recognize what you did during the crisis so it's very important as a country as the hot as a hotel or as a travel agent or as an airline for the there are there are two perspectives as the world tourism forum institute we are looking for i mean the first one is the our approach is on the investment side and the other is the marketing side as we see on the ghana ghana is going to be succeed especially on the marketing side when they open the visit ghana i mean there is a ghana uh, instagram and the uh, web portal so it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing, and they are giving the good messages to the world. So it's very, very important. For the investment side, it's, it's the crucial. So, okay, we have a security in the, in the city or in the airport or in the destination, but on the investment side, you have to, you have to create a huge security on the financially. So when an when a investor is going to come in Ghana or in another destination, in Africa, so it's crucial. The governments have to create the atmosphere of the financial security. It means the investor will put the money. After then, they start and create the jobs, and then they start the work. Hotels, airports, maybe marina. I don't know. So, which opportunities that they are putting the money? After then, when the things are done, when they feel okay, I'm here, it's fine. So I'm going to get out of the country. So they have to be feel comfortable when they are getting out of the money. So this is the most important and crucial thing that I'm going to emphasize. But and, not, and also, especially for the education side that you are mentioning, what Turkey did very well, the education. Because in Europe, lots of countries, you are going lots of five-star hotels, but the education is not, I mean, the, 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 the service quality is not well like Turkey, like Dubai, or like Egypt. So the most important thing is you can billion dollar property, but the most important thing is the property is property there. The luxury or the concept is your guys who is serving inside that. We get the, I mean the uh, high profile tourist in the destination. So this is the most important thing uh, that we observed. Uh, actually, thank you very much again. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of you in this webinar so thank you thank you thank you so very much uh mr bulut bakshi 
um, I love how you were so positive about um, Ghana's potential in the tourism industry and the tips that you shared. Uh, we look forward to having you again when the borders are going to open and we will tell you, of course, Aquaba. Um, we are yeah, trying Aquaba, to back yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, to go back to... Uh, actually, the thing is, uh, one, 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 yes, one, one of the gentlemen said the, the Dubai, okay, they, they discovered the potential of petrol. After then, they turned their, 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 their sector to tourism. Uh, what I see at the West Africa, there is no exactly place uh, to be recognized like the Dubai of Africa. So Ghana can be that, can be this destination. I mean, Dubai of the West Africa. Why not? Because you have a good airport, you have a, a hotels. I mean, the, the Kempinski, uh, the uh, Moenpik, and the local local brands. You have lots of things. So you achieve lots of things. But a small uh, tricks have to be done. I think it will it will not take too much time, and I'm sure that the, because the vision and the leaders' vision are very smart, so I'm sure that uh, all together we will achieve lots of things in Ghana. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Amazing, Hello. amazing, amazing. So we are going back to uh, Kwesi, Mr. Kwesi Ayison. Um, Vice President of Atov and President uh, at uh, Tuga, Mr. Kwesi Yison. Finally, we have you here live and clear, right? Yeah, finally. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but yes, and we can see you good. as well. Good, fantastic. Sorry about that, H. Um, <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, everyone, to our distinguished panel members and all participants. Uh, let me see all protocols duly observed. Um, I bring you warm fraternal greetings from the Ghana Tourism Federation, made up of over 30 trade associations, namely Tour Operators Union of Ghana, Ghana Hotels Association, Car Rentals Association, Tour Guides Association for you. Let me extend our sincere appreciation to the Chamber for Tourism Industry Ghana and ArtCourt for this virtual conference themed pushing Africa's tourism and trade frontier through digitization during pandemics. The theme for this virtual conference could not have come at a better time than this period when the COVID-19 pandemic has, in spite of its devastating effects on trade and tourism, presented an opportunity to leapfrog Africa's digitalization drive. For years, the, dig the digital divide in Africa and between Africa and the rest of the world has showed digital transformation of our enterprises, resulting in market disruption for our trade and tourism sectors of our economies by multinational companies outside Africa, examples of which are Uber in the transport sector, Airbnb in the accommodation, and e-commerce transactions on various virtual marketplace sites such as Amazon, eBay, Alibaba, etc. This pandemic has, however, compelled enterprises, particularly in the informal sectors of Africa's economy, mainly the micro, small, medium scale enterprises, which constitute majority of businesses in the trade and the tourism sectors, to embrace digitization and digitalization aimed at digitally transformed enterprise operations. I must say the drive towards this digital transformation, however, requires change and restructuring for our business models towards the achievement of operational excellence in the areas of efficiency, effectiveness, and superior electricity, and empowered workforce with digital skills. Let me say that digital transformation of Africa's trade and tourism frontiers similarly requires transition of the informal sectors of our economics to the formal sectors through digitalization to withstand market disruptions, be sustainably competitive, and bridge the inequality gap for inclusive digitalization of trade and tourism so no one is left behind. With the anticipated increase of about 33% intra-Africa trade, from its paltry and the 15% level, and the multiply effect in tourism following the implementation of the Africa Continental Free Trade Zone area 
from here. I'd like to thank once again the Chamber of Tourism, Ghana, and ADCOT for this brilliant initiative and wish all speakers and participants a very successful virtual conference. Thank you very much for this opportunity and wish you all the best of luck. Thank you. Virtual Yedase, we thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Kwesi Eyison. We are delighted at the Chamber for Tourism Industry Ghana to have the support of, uh, you know, Gatov and uh, Tuga, uh, where you operate. Um, remember, you are watching uh, the live webinar of the African Digitization Conference on Tourism and Trade. We are streaming it live from the NDPC, National Developing uh, Planning Commission in Accra, uh, Ghana. And we are in the company of distinguished speakers, which we are very proud to have. Uh, remember that everyone who is not speaking has to mute themselves, please. And um, I want to remind you that in our lineup of 15 top speakers, we do have with us um, Honorable and Sophie Ave, French ambassador to Ghana, um, as well as uh, Mr. Sol Molobi of Grand Hill Africa, former South African Consulate General to Italy. We will soon head over to the French Embassy, but first we're going to go all the way to South Africa to uh, talk to Mr. Sol Molobi. Uh, Sol, are you please online? And if you are, please unmute yourself and present yourself to the audiences. Mr. Sol, can you please hear us? Hello, Mr. So. All right, so um, we, okay, there we, there we go. Hello. Please unmute yourself, Mr. So, we don't hear you. So you, you don't seem to be muted, but uh, please check your, your computer settings. <laughs> In, um, I think we're making some progress here but we cannot hear you still. So it could be a sentence with, um, with your uh, computer audio. What we could do in the meantime, um, what I would propose is that you check your computer audio to make sure that uh, you can be heard. But in the meantime, what we will do is we're going back to Ghana where we are streaming live and we are going to um, go to um, the French embassy with Honorable Anne Sophie Ave, whom we are very proud to have in the lineup. Um, Madame Anne Sophie. Bonjour. Bonjour. Uh, je vais bien, merci. I think we have to carry on in English, otherwise we're going to lose exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. <laughs> for your French. Um, thanks very much for having me and congratulations for this opportunity of gathering people around this theme of tourism. Um, I was wondering why you very kindly invited me, and um, but you said that France is a high place of tourism. Exactly. But on top of that, I think the French are places. Um, in Ghana, we have 1,300 French. So uh, the testimony I'm going to share is uh, what I understand from what the French are looking for when they're traveling abroad and discovering countries, and what the French in Ghana have uh, had as experiences when they traveled around Ghana. Um, and just add into it uh, one of the reasons why we are, one of the, the angle we are cooperating with Ghana is precisely the, uh, in, in the area of tourism where we are uh, in tw for 2020, 2021, we're running a program when we, where we exchange um, some, some knowledge and we, uh, we are trying to do some capacity building to um, train some, some Ghanaians uh, to value their, their assets and, and um, uh, know how to uh, present all the assets they have through museums or uh, because you do have a lot of assets. So it just takes a little... Uh, uh, maybe capacity building or just pointing out the things that you don't realize would be of some interest for foreigners and namely for the French. What I'd like to say is that when the French go uh, overseas to travel, they do not expect to find the exact same thing wherever they go. 
uh, if they want to have a feel of, of Asian culture, they will go to Asia. If they want to have something that is more or less artificial and have uh, uh, the, the beautiful beaches, be they artificial, they will go to Dubai. Um, so it's important that wherever they go, they find something different. And that is typical of the area that they are visiting. If they want a, a, a wonderful safari, they will go to Kenya or some places in South Africa. So what, what Ghana needs to find is what their assets are and what they have to show that no one else, no one else could show. So that when people say we've, we've been to Ghana, uh, it's, it's not like they've been anywhere, but they have been able to see and experience things that they have not experienced anywhere. Um, we are quite uh, tempted now by the, what we call cultural uh, tourism. Uh, it's no longer lying on the beach and, and, and uh, uh, getting tanned. Um, it's also learning something. So there's, there's a lot to learn if you go to Ghana that only needs to be probably a bit more organized. We would like to learn about Kente. Um, and uh, if there was a circuit where you can see how um, this this tradition of kente is is uh, uh, has been created, what is it about how to 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 wear it, uh, wove it, and how to uh, how to wear it, and and what it means, and all the designs of kente? There's a lot to tell about that, but this chain has to be organized. Same about koko. I'm sure that people would like to have. Uh, uh, knowledge about how this this whole um, uh, production chain is is, uh, is is existing and how where does that come from? Uh, same for shibata. Um, we we you have so much to share in Ghana about your traditions and value. If you are lucky to go and visit traditional chiefs and have a guide who explains to you all the traditions and 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 the the, the protocol. You learn a lot about the values that are being shared and, and that are so important and that are the foundation of uh, the, the, the Ghanaian uh, people and society. Um, and also we, we, we like to have a very traditional things. We don't want to, we wouldn't like Ghana to become a, a, a tourism area made of concrete that would, that would look like any other area. Like uh, in some places, for instance, in Morocco, it is uh, so typically directed for tourists where any goods that are sold are uh, much more expensive because they are targeting the tourists. So what, what you need to find to, to keep in Ghana is the genuine um, uh, side of uh, and feel of, of uh, Africa. So developing tourism is, is, uh, uh, is cherishing the values and the core um, the core values heritage that that you have we also ha you also have a very important history and heritage um, most of the french and european don't know anything about africa before the end of colonization but africa wasn't born in the 1960s you have thousands of th thousand years history and it's important that somehow so either through museum or to, through circuits of visits, you can show that uh, Africa was there for a long time and, and has a very strong traditions. And, and again, those traditions explain the values that are uh, keeping the society together. And this is something that uh, through museums or through circuits you could do. Um, and uh, the, the last thing, because you probably need to to attract the, 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 the tourists, uh, have a diversity of, of offer, uh, culture, history, but also some sort of uh, sports activities or something a bit more uh, dynamic. And um, that's another asset of Ghana. You have a diversity of, of uh, uh, sightseeing and of places where you can do uh, hiking circuits. Um, and, and, and surprise people, because if you go to the Volta region, it looks so much like the center of France, where you ha it's so green, it's like mountains. They're, they're, you, could, you could travel in less. Another issue, finally, is also sports tourism, which is almost non-existent. The Chamber for Tourism Industry Ghana um, released um, a press release um, some three weeks ago to highlight how sports tourism is 
um, an untapped market in Ghana particularly. But um, as we are going into this topic, uh, we want to start off with uh, the issue of air travel, air travel in Africa being twice as expensive as that in Latin, Latin America, four times that in the United States. Can you just imagine? So my question to uh, our distinguished speaker, uh, Madam Esther Ama Asante, who joined us uh, from uh, Ghana, is how can digitized trade and tourism offer a solution to reduce the cost of air travel in Africa. Madam Esther, can you hear us? Thank you very much for giving me the floor. I hear you playing loud. Um, yes, anyway, um, I will want to start with the fact that the current situation we are in is, um, if you look at the reports we have from the World Economic Forum, you see that there's a huge gap between travelers from Africa and other nations uh, while Africans make up about 12% of the world's population, uh, they are only 2.5% of the world's passengers. So there's a problem here. And the root cause uh, is that there are several barriers and challenges that exist. And these include, but not limited to the poor connectivity, lack of proper infrastructure, uh, liberalization and high ticket costs. And taking a typical scenario, for instance, it's easier to travel from Africa to Europe or ship goods from Africa to Europe than to move cargo or travel within the continent. Uh, the reason being that there is no direct flight between African countries and an African traveler has no other way but to fly to second or even third country uh, before reaching the final destination within the continent. And unfortunately, uh, due to lack of uh, political willpower in some cases and proper planning, airport infrastructure in most African countries is obsolete and not built to serve the growing volume of passengers of movement of cargo. And another issue is that airlines are, and airports are often managed by uh, government entities or regulatory bodies leading to corruption and prevention of private investment. Uh, so it is estimated that on average, low cost carrier um, about one quarter of all flights globally. And how, however, in Africa, they are below 10%. And this is the main reason why ticket prices are somewhat so expensive on the continent. But uh, we should see all these challenges as, as opportunities. In the first place, uh, we know that aviation sector in Africa has the potential to fuel economic growth. Um, the continent counts over 400 air airlines and has 730 airports with an aviation industry that uh, supports about 7 million jobs and 37 uh, around um, 80 million in economic activity. So, Pre-COVID-19 already, um, there was a focus on digit, uh, digital marketing and, and economy um, and e-commerce as, as a way of uh, reaching new markets, uh, engaging customers and building or uh, strengthening brands. So according to the Insight, for instance, latest report that, that you see online um, on, on the impact and um, opportunities of e-commerce for trade and development, much of the digital innovation in the, in the last few years is taking place on the continent of Africa. And indeed, the fight against the COVID-19, um, um, some government in Africa, and I'm referring to the Ministry of Trade and SMEs in Senegal and the Ministry of ICT in Uganda in particular, uh, they partnered with uh, the private sector to facilitate uh, delivery of uh, essential goods and services um, through e-commerce to support health system and public service delivery. And it is obvious that digital economies and technologies have important implications for the tourism sector and businesses um, of all sizes. Uh, for the structure and uh, operations of tourism value chains and, and the sector um, as a whole, more than ever before, I believe that facilitating and enabling uh, digitization in tourism is a key policy challenge. Uh, but now, the way forward, I think government across the world, and Africa in particular, must take advantage of this crisis to, to, to prepare the tourism sector 
for digital uh, future and the future is now when we talk about the future is it's uh, thanks to corona future is now and we will emphasize on the key role of, of uh, government in creating the right framework uh, conditions for the digital transformation of of tourism uh, business models and, and the wider tourism ecosystem such as uh, championing in, uh, intercontinental aviation for, for the economic and social benefit for the African aviation sector. And I also think that government must um, identify a number of key policy concerns uh, to foster uh, digital technology up, uptake and, and use uh, by, by uh, tourism SMEs. Um, one other point uh, I think I have to talk about will be that, the, that all stakeholders and key players must be actively involved in the discussion on trade facilitation among African countries, finding solutions to um, affordable and reliable connectivity, putting in place measures that will harmonize trade uh, procedures and transit regimes and um, trade facilitation monitoring tools, uh, such as encouraging the use of mobile payments. I uh, will also encourage more African countries to sign up to uh, the single African air transport market introduced in 2019 with the aim to open up African airspace and improve intra-African air connectivity. And hopefully uh, the inclusion of the e-commerce on the agenda of the African continental free trade area will indeed facilitate more regional cross-border digital transaction and business. Thank you. Hmm. Very interesting points, um, Madam Esther. Um, you were in the aviation sector, I believe, from uh, 2015 to uh, to 2018. Uh, quickly, before we take um, comments from Madam Beatrice Sheto from the AU Commission, I I want to know: Did you notice because you were the quality manager and commercial manager at a Swiss Sports Limited, which is a multinational company from Switzerland? I want to know if you noticed an increase in trade, uh, be it uh, intercontinental or regional, uh, in the country, because you were dealing with cargo, I believe. Yes, indeed, I was de dealing with cargo because this port is a grand handler. Um, unfortunately, most of our um, goods were from Africa to Europe or other parts of the world, and um, like I'm mentioned earlier on, doing business in Africa is extremely difficult because of lots of barriers that are put in place. Um, in my case, for instance, having also to manage a company called uh, Organic Trade Investment and we are into e-commerce and export trading, um, the problem we are facing and we are currently facing is um, shipping goods from West Africa to uh, East Africa. It, it's something that cannot be done overnight uh, because they require you to get a certificate of conformity and all that whole um, document that it's um, uh, really slowing down business and trade between uh, Africans. Meanwhile, in other countries, for instance, it's so easy to move uh, cargo or even uh, human movements. Uh, so it's something that it's still um, on, on discussion. And I think, I hope that with the African um, free trade area, something is going to be uh, done and, and quickly and fast because we have lots of potentials in Africa. And if we uh, utilize whatever we have on the continent and we open up our borders strategically, I think we will benefit from it more than ever. Excellent points, valid points made. Uh, thank you so much. Your point about the um, African uh, uh, continental free trade area uh, was indeed well noted. Uh, the good thing is that we have uh, Madame Beatrice uh, Chato. Uh, she's not with us live, but she pre-recorded um, her, her answers. And uh, the follow-up question we have on uh, Madame Esther Maasanti's uh, wonderful contributions to open this opening plenary uh, session is um, basically about the, the visa requirements because we're talking about trade, right? We're talking about how um, uh, digitization can offer you know, a solution to reduce a cost of air travel in Africa. We want more movement. Yes, more movement of goods, more movement of people. But the question really at this point is that, um, you know, when, when we are relaxing, um, visa requirements for, for the people. 
when we are re rely, you know, the, we are trying to reduce the rigid visa requirements due to our frontiers are slowing down the movement of goods and people on the continent. Um, whilst cancelling or relaxing all of that, we also know that this could intensify the risk of fraudulent activities because things move so fast. So. Uh, the, the question, we, we will first take uh, this answer from Madame Beatrice, and I know that Esther, uh, Madame Esther, you also have a point to make on, on that, but the question is, what role really can digitization play in offering um, a healthy balance between relaxed visa policies and at the same time, um, you know, keep, keep corruption uh, in check? So um, we have Madame uh, Beatrice who uh, shared her views on that. Um, she is a uh, senior, you know, uh, expert in trading services uh, at the African What uh, role can Union. digitization play in offering a healthy balance between relaxed visa policies and keeping corruption in check? Well, the most significant initiative for digital transformation is the African continental free trade area. Reducing import and export duties and trade restrictions will create a huge market with an enormous potential for productivity among firms and businesses in Africa, including in the tourism sector. And now we have the AU Digital Trade and Transformation Strategy, which was launched at the last AU Summit in February 2020, and it provides a path to the use of digital trade and e-commerce to help catalyze the development of certain industries like tourism. But a key policy issue that affects the tourism sector concerns the free movement of people. The idea is to keep people moving and enabling their easy choices about their tourism destinations. In the context of the AFCFTA, we want people to choose African destinations and thereby develop the African tourism market. Maintaining restrictions such as visa requirements limits the opportunities for regional tourism. This is why we are urging African Union member states to continue to ratify the AFCFTA agreement, which has already entered into force, and also to sign and ratify the AU protocol on free movement, under which the AU passport is being rolled out. Imagine if all Africans were able to move freely in each other in each other's countries using the AU passport. That would be an important step in driving the development of the tourism industry across the continent. We see practice already across Africa in relation to simplified or liberal visa policies, such as Seychelles, which requires no entry visas, or the East African community, where there is a single tourist visa for countries moving between Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. And then you have Ghana, Kenya, Rwanda that require no entry visas for all African countries. Among ECOWAS countries, free movement of persons has been established for years using the ECOWAS passport and residence card or permit. Now the West African countries are considering establishment of a regional visa called the ECO visa that will facilitate movement of visitors within the sub-region. Of course, digitization is a powerful tool for ensuring transparency, for contributing to efficiency, increasing productivity, and for shortening the length of applications and other processes. This actually helps to create certainty and predictability for business and leisure visitors. Digitization can help to reduce excessive and duplicative regulation and cut down on informal payments. Use of e-visas has helped countries like Ethiopia and Rwanda increase passenger and tourist numbers to both countries. Imagine if the eco-visa is an e-visa from the very beginning, so that there's less hassle for visitors to West Africa, which is backed up by the ease of e-payments. That said, it should be underlined that digitization can only play a role where there are already standards and systems in place for interacting with visitors and for receiving them at the point of entry. There's no point having an e-visa process in place and then having visitors being subjected to unprofessional immigration officers or airport staff when they arrive. The idea should be to take a comprehensive approach to processes and procedures for visa and immigration, and then build on that with digitization to make the overall experience by visitors and even residents a good one for them.
Ex excellent points from uh, from Madam uh, Beatrice Cheto, who couldn't join us due to um, a last minute, uh, you know, urgent commitment. So, uh, but we will still have some thoughts from her uh, moving on uh, in the opening plenary. And before we we move to uh, Mr. Fergus McLaren in the U uh, in in Canada, sorry, um, Madam Esther, you wanted to make a point on this same matter regarding. Um, how you know relaxing uh, visa um, requirements could um, you know create more corruption, and then due to that, how digitization could offer you know a solution uh, by balancing all of that. Uh, so, uh, Madam Esther, please, if you are still on the line with us, uh, can you share your brief opinion on that, and then we will move into. Um, take thoughts on another topic from Mr. Ferguson in Canada. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, Andrew, indeed. Um, so, like I was saying, the question of visas uh, needs rethinking seriously. And, and the con in the context of easy movements of people, tourism on the continent, it will not be wise uh, to rigidify um, visa policies. It's rather unfortunate that acquiring visa for intra-Africa tr uh, travel remains a big challenge. As you can see, only a, a few countries in Africa um, offer visas upon arrival to African nationals. And it's proven that relaxing visa policies on the continent will underpin Africa's tourism sector and will create jobs for our youth, uh, boosting economic growth in, in the areas of hotels, transports, restaurants, and the malls. And a typical example is with Rwanda, who is a strong supporter of visa-free Africa. Um, after easing visa um, restriction by, by introducing a visa on arrival for all African citizens and abolishing work permits for East African citizens, you see that the country saw a, a spectacular increase in tourism arrivals of more than 20% and a 50% increase in intra-African trade. And African countries that have embarked on a visa liberalization scam are um, expected to grow by more than 8% annually over the next 20 years. Um, then again, how digitization can be used to manage our borders and fight corruption efficiently will all depend on the role reg uh, regional organizations uh, can or will play in aligning a visa policy with that of the African continental free trade area. So one of the main aspects we should look at, um, and this is for every government in Africa, is to tackle and fight corruption at our borders. It's important that border officials receive regular trainings activities to maintain quality standard and help them understand their responsibilities clear operating um, pro procedures must be established and, I, and, and every border staff uh, should be held to account for any breaches. Another point will be that African countries must encourage cross-border cooperation. We must be open to share data with uh, neighboring countries. This is a way of fighting any form of criminal activities. And, and the, the tool, uh, one tool that um, government can use is digitization of, of payment system. Um, you see millions of dollars are dis, uh, disappearing from government's coffins every year. Two countries in Africa, Rwanda and Tanzania, have adopted the use of connectivity and technology um, innovation uh, measures to, to reduce uh, leakage and increase revenue digitization of bus first by, by the Rwandan government led uh, the country to a 140% increase in revenue. So digitization of the system will um, definitely help government to tackle um, um, corruption, but we must not forget that human beings are behind this system and therefore we should look beyond that and, and build stronger economies and governments uh, by putting in place policies that will regulate our society and educate the people who are um, the first beneficiaries of good governance. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much for these solutions. Uh, we hope that people are taking notes because definitely after ADCOT, 
um, we will continue to follow up on all that can be done uh, for Africa to uh, develop uh, its terrains of uh, tourism, trade, and, um, and uh, technology. Uh, on this note, we are heading live to Canada where uh, Mr. Fergus uh, McLaren is joining us. A reminder that Mr. Fergus McLaren is the Director of International Relations and Knowledge Management um, at the Economic Innovation Institute for Africa. He has a vast you know, amount of experience in international tourism, um, and he also has his seat at the UNESCO. So we are extremely proud to have him on the panel. Mr. Fergus McLaren, uh, we are still going to, to go into the topic right away because time is running out, but we love all the contributions that we've had so far, and we have no, um, you know, we have no doubt that your contribution is going to be as rich as what we've heard so far. Uh, you know, as we follow up on digitization, we know that it does require huge funding, but can a percentage of earnings in tourism and trade be possibly allocated to a digitization fund across Africa? Please share this, um, you know, with, with us. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Fergus, please uh, unmute yourself. Kindly unmute yourself. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, thank uh, you. Much better. Uh, thank you, Madam Angela. That was a great intro. Uh, good very early morning from Canada. Bonjour, Aquaba. Very nice to meet you all. And uh, greetings to uh, friends, colleagues, and uh, others who are joining us for this uh, excellent event. Um, about in a month's time, on September 27th, it's, it's going to be World Tourism Day. Two years ago, a uh, tourism organization had as its focus tourism and the digital transformation. That was the theme for World Tourism Day two years ago. Uh, the key aspect that they wanted to try and present was that digital technologies have the potential to disrupt the tourism sector, impacting the way destinations facilitate tourism, develop product, gather data, access markets, and attract visitors. This is in 2018. That was pre-COVID. And I think that's really important to recognize that there's a pivot that's going on right now, but with that pivot, that infrastructure, that ecosystem was already being built in terms of digital payments, in terms of communicating with people overseas via Zoom or Google Meet as we are right now. There are other ways in terms of uh, booking engines, um, Wi-Fi connectivity, all these other facets that were very important in terms of the pre-COVID tourism circumstances, but they are now key to where we are right now to at least hold steady as we've seen numbers decline, but also as a basis that we can use to move forward. And this is when we start talking about investment and how do we use this money? Where should it go? Individual countries, regions, continental Africa, I mean, there's a sort of a, a landscape out there that we really have to think about in terms of how we are going to uh, promote this as these different aspects of digitization to promote tourism in Africa, but what's also realistic in terms of the funding that can come from it and how it should be allocated. So, you know, there are a couple of trends that were uh, have been going on in the uh, this person to person accommodation. They think of Airbnb. You're starting to see that a lot more in parts of Africa as well, where you're creating more local economies and more local accommodation. Uh, you have services like Booking.com or TripAdvisor, where you have peer to peer reviews. So you're getting more of a sense of a place through that sort of digital stream of communications. Uh, there are also platforms that are developing economies to leapfrog. Uh, conventional destination management challenges, such as marketing, promotion, uh, connecting partner services amongst each other, and to boost competitiveness of these destinations, either at a municipal level, a country level, or regional level. Uh, there are also partnerships that should be established between governments and international organizations because a lot of the marketing dollars internationally or regionally are spent at the national and regional level. And it's really important to try and establish those places on the digital platforms and also the monetary support behind it. And finally, there is the need to find a way to provide those regions with infrastructure. 
beyond beyond the coast, beyond Kamasi, beyond some of the other more famous, more well-known places in the country, to drive tourism to places outside of the major urban centers and destinations. So you can use digital technologies for those purposes. So you know there are a few things I just want to go through, and just you know thinking about challenges, recommendations, and funding. Challenges right now, skills in terms of how we're going to use that digital funding, where is it going to be allocated towards? Finance is always the biggest challenge in terms of the money, uh, where it come from, how are you going to be able to uh, allocate it? Uh, infrastructure. Some countries in parts of Africa have better digital infrastructures than others. Uh, there's more uptake in terms of mobile communications and other sorts of uh, uh, supports that are there for the like airports and roads and uh, transport systems services etc they're all part of that infrastructure uh, mentoring support you know who's working with who to bring people through academic programs or tourism or particularly in remote regions to bring them on board onto this digital landscape and finally policy support what is the government doing to support these kinds of initiatives, whether it's through the continental free trade area, whether through uh, the Eastern, the eco visa that was mentioned previously, whether it is other initiatives that can really support tourism across different aspects of the, of the, of the country's tourism sector. In terms of recommendations, you know, policies are uh, really important in terms of being appropriate, but also at the same time, uh, using digital means to try and encourage visitation. I've traveled in a number of countries around the world that use e-visas, such as Ethiopia or India, and it really helps to, fac to facilitate uh, travel because otherwise you're working for, you're waiting for a week or two at high cost to obtain a visa, which really sets people off and they don't have that, their passport for that period of time. So e-visas, again, very important. Um, technical assistance, in many ways, is some countries, Africa, some are more advanced than others in terms of their opportunity to absorb this money, but also to put it to use within their existing ecosystems. Um, access to reliable digital infrastructure, we've talked about that before. Some countries better Wi-Fi, some, guys, some countries better digital backbones. Again, how are you able to work with that? And finally, research and development. Uh, there's a very good book out right now called Beyond the Valley that talks about made in Africa solutions that resolve different problems that are, you know, you don't have to go to North America, you don't have to go to Europe. Best example of that is M-Pesa. And think of that as a digital currency that is there to ensure that uh, the there are opportunities to have made in Africa solutions to take part in and construct your own or improve your own digital landscapes. Finally, in terms of funding, you know, as you mentioned before, it's one of the biggest issues in terms of participation. Uh, some countries have gone towards uh, or co-branding and partnering with uh, different hotel chains, airlines, or others as part of their apps. And so when you go to some place like the App Store, perhaps there's a way that you could get a percentage of that app sale to put into a digitization fund for that country, for that region, or for elsewhere. Um, there's also the sale of cultural and intellectual property branded goods. So to that end, uh, there are some goods that are specific to Ghana, for example, like uh, Kente or some of the uh, woodworking or other things that are part of cultural products. And how do you use that in other forms, such as publications, weaving, greeting cards, et cetera, and how do you gain a percentage of that to put it towards a digital fund? Uh, you can also partner with curated tours and exclusive engagements and events. So you can have certain events at museums or destinations, uh, such as in uh, Kumasi or Tamale or elsewhere, at uh, some of the World Heritage Sites that are in near Kumasi, like the Ashanti buildings there, and you can host events that can generate revenue towards uh, the fund. Uh, there are also digital ad advertisements and web sponsorships of websites and digital exhibits. Again, you can do it either as a GoFundMe or as a price of entry. And uh, finally, what I refer to as digital tombstones. So basically those elements that make it unique as a form of interaction, where if you were to visit a certain site or a certain place, a certain destination virtually, 
there are ways that you can have aspects of if you come to this museum in Accra, or if you go to one of the castles in Elmira, or in Cape Coast, for example, there are ways you can get a certain amount of 10% uh, off for a meal or for shopping or for something else. And a percentage of that can go in towards a digital fund. So there are all kinds of mechanisms that are there, but I think that you have to look at it from, as opposed to one big drop of cash uh, from a grant or from a partner, look at it as a way of some sort of uh, ongoing uh, small percentage of funds that would accumulate quickly and effectively over time. So um, it's important to really look at it from the disruptive sort of perspective, but also as a way to say, you know, there are opportunities here that we can build on the culture and traditions of the country virtually and derive revenue from that to start building our digital presence across the continent. Thank you. Wow, uh, a lot of ideas right there that, uh, like I said, viewers, I hope you are taking notes because this is free knowledge on the plate, on the golden platter for, for all of us. Uh, a lot of, uh, of solutions there to, um, to you know, create some kind of funds for uh, digitization. On this note, um, we should go to Geneva in Switzerland, if I'm right, where um, our uh, opening plenary speaker, uh, Madame Caroline Kimunto from the International Trade Center. Uh, she is the Associate Program Officer, and um, she's joining us. Uh, Madame Caroline, can you can you hear us, please? Yes, I can. Hello. Hello, Angela. Fantastic. Um, so, so, you know, we, we're talking about um, digitization, of course. Um, we heard Mr. Fergus uh, McLaren, who, who gave, you know, solutions to, um, to create a fund um, by, you know, some kind of, um, taking some kind of, um, some amount from, from other, you know, uh, mechanisms. Uh, the question is, when that fund is done, right, okay. But then we have to digitize archives in Africa. Uh, and we know it's, it can be extremely expensive and not just expensive, but also very, um, you know, uh, time consuming uh, because it's something that you have to go through one at a time. You know, when we are talking about archives, it could be books, uh, it could be, um, uh, you know, paintings, all of this, if you, we want to digitize them, they will need uh, manpower. In other words, I mean, is definitely an avenue for, for job creation uh, in Africa's IT sector. The fact of the matter is we really cannot talk about digitization, you know, uh, digitizing the tourism and trade uh, terrains in Africa without accelerating technology innovations on the continent. Now, having said that, while African tourism and trade are visibly growing, at a pretty much you know considerable rate can we say the same really about its it sector is it really up to speed is it you know is it ready to assist uh, the economic potential uh, from the tourism and trade sectors uh, madam caroline please take the floor thank you so much angela um i think fergus had touched a lot on the points regarding your question um, specifically on how it's not possible to digitize tourism and trade in Africa without accelerating technological innovations. Um, we've seen that the IT sector is, is growing at a considerable rate and it has already led to greater opportunities for other sectors through digitalization and also increasing efficiency through digitization. Um, this can already be seen in Africa's major cities like South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Ethiopia, where consumers have disposable income they, with more than half already having internet capable devices and also 3G networks are up and running. Um, and also we've seen that investments in African tech startups are also rising with in 2018 investments reached around $1.2 billion. So this growing wave of innovation and the rise of incubators, accelerator hubs, e-commerce sites, digital entertainment platforms, mobile health technologies, online education content, they all paved the way for also the tourism sector to tap into. There's no point to try and reinvent a wheel, but more to really use already the existing capabilities around the market environment. Um, on this note, uh, we see that also um, the share of Africa's population that is going online is rising. 
Um, based on the Internet World stats, we see that Internet penetration in Africa in March was at 39% with around 526 million Internet users compared to 16% only in 2013. So there's also an increase of Internet penetration in Ghana, which is currently at 37%, Nigeria 61, Kenya 87, South Africa 56, and Botswana 45. So we can see that um, this has been due to urbanization, the rising middle class. We also have a very large youthful population that is embracing technology um, and also the expanded coverage of internet in rural areas, the ease of accessibility of mobile networks, and also the low cost of these mobile technologies. They're all paving the way for digitization for the tourism sector. So I can say that the internet has been a catalyst, can be a catalyst also for the tourism sector, especially in the sense that um, it's running parallel, techno digital technologies is running parallel with um, our culture and also just the tourism sector in itself, and modern technology is changing and how we experience them. Um, but there definitely needs to be greater investment in that digital infrastructure. As you mentioned, with archives, you need that information management, data management, um, also the right amount of human capital with required technological skills. So we need a workforce that um, has, for instance, quality education in maths and science, and also enrollment rates in tertiary education to be able to really handle um, digitizing or digitizing archives and making sure human error is not there. Um, so for these new technologies, I believe they're still continuing to be developed. And there's also no one size fits all uh, type of technology. Everything has to be according to the context of the different African countries. They're all facing different um, challenges or opportunities that they can all tap into. Um, for instance, now we're seeing a lot of um, digital collections from museums, whether they're being posted online or sculptures are being digitized in 3D to enable online visitors to see every angle of the art piece. Um, so these, there will be also a greater need for digital managers who can organize and interpret that content to best serve online customers. And to this extent, um, the IT sector has can be a catalyst for changing the way, um, changing business models creatively, also improving that online content, and also empowering people working in the tourism sector to be more comfortable with digital. Um, however, the pace also for digitization in some sectors of tourism due to lack of human resources, technological skills, unaffordable technology, and also communication facilities, um, these can also be overcome through partnerships and collaborations, especially with the IT startups or incubators or accelerator hubs. One example that I have is Andela. This, um, this startup recruits African software engineers, staff, and they train them in the campuses in Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda. They hire them out as full-time distributed teams to companies across Africa and the world. So tourism can really tap into the already existing um, capabilities that are around, especially with the AFC, AFCFTA, it's going to be much more easier to really cherry pick the type of um, skills that the tourism sector would need to digitize. So far, Andela has hired around 1,200 African developers over the past four years, and they're supplying their services to 200 companies worldwide. So. I believe the tourism sector can become more successful in diversifying and also building on these existing capabilities and also the knowledge that the IT sector already has available rather than trying to reinvent that wheel. Um, we may also maybe see a rise of hybrid libraries um, that, that may help uh, maybe virtual museums uh, in that data and information management. So it would ease that burden of maybe not having that digital skills or the manpower that is needed to really digitize archives or um, in that sense. Um, my last address is also that um, in order to really tap into the digital opportunities, we also need to reassess our strategies and adapt them 
in ways that are unique to each country. Um, we can expect different levels of digital maturity across industries. This includes in leveraging digital technology, the extent of cultural innovation, the adoption of digital operations, and also the digital customer offerings of the countries um, themselves. Um, we also cannot ignore that there is a digital divide due to the unequal access between people living in urban areas and also rural areas. So in order for us to have an enabling environment for tourism to digitize, um, there's a need for the government and the private sector to roll out internet access to also rural centers in the same way that it has with traditional infrastructure like basic um, services, sanitation, transport and energy. Also, it should be a right for people to have internet access. Um, also to provide a healthy business environment, the same infrastructure, and also to increase digital literacy. Um, additionally, we've seen that the pandemic has illustrated how interconnected the world is and diversifying our partnerships in the tourism sector, not just relying, for example, because we know how um, tourism has touches upon different, as, different sectors like agribusiness, like textiles, but not so much on IT unless it needs to be a means to an end, maybe using through digital marketing, for instance. But we really now need to tap into diversifying our partnerships to capture these economic opportunities. Um, and this would include um, partnerships between the government, businesses, local and international, labor, and also academia, because they would provide that research and development aspect that the tourism sector would need. and. Um, this would also help in changing mindsets and also implementing the right policies to create an environment for knowledge sharing and execution. That is my address to you. Wow, fantastic address, uh, Madam Caroline Kimunzo, Associate Program Officer at the International um, Trade Center. Um, I think you made several good points um, there that you know can can help the the IT sector get up to speed with uh, the tourism and trade uh, sectors. Uh, let's go over to um, Madam Beatrice Shato, who we know is not with with us, but she said she shared an address. So uh, we were going to listen to what she had to say, um, and we're going to play that in a moment. Remember that uh, Madam Beatrice. Uh, could not be with us live due to an urgent commitment, but she's still with us, not only in spirit, but also thanks to technology, she was able to um, pre-record that. So let's go over and um, hear what she has to say on the topic of, uh, you know, uh, finding ways for the IT sector to be up to speed with development in the tourism and trade terrains on the African continent. Is the African IT sector up to speed to assist the economic potential from tourism and trade? I think the first thing to say is it's important to remember the features of tourism. It is a services industry and the product is consumed at the point of production. This sector is complex, it's cross-sectoral, it's highly dynamic. This is because of its structure. You have a mix of small and large businesses that draw on domestic, regional, and international markets. You've also got its different components, especially natural and man-made attractions. Tourism fluctuates with seasons, and it is affected by multiple external factors, including changes in foreign exchange rates, state of transport at the destination market, health and security concerns, social and cultural practices, and catastrophic events. It is perishable, it competes in a global marketplace, and is subject to consumer trends. The sector consists of several tangible and intangible components. The tangible components include transport systems like air, rail, road, You've got water systems, issues to do with electricity. You've got hospitality services such as accommodation, food and beverages, tours, souvenirs. And then you have related services such as banking, insurance and safety and security. 
the intangible components include rest and relaxation, culture, escape, adventure, and new and different experiences. Even with the use of digital means to market and trade in the tourism sector, all the other attendant features of the tourism industry have got to be in place. There's no point posting beautiful pictures on websites or easing booking processes for hotels and other accommodation through digital means if the ultimate experience for the customer is not going to be the best it can be. It only takes one bad review to go viral to kill a tourism product like a spa or a hotel or a museum or place of interest. So the infrastructure and logistics and the hospitality services like electricity, water, food, transport, banking, for instance, use of payment options, insurance, safety, security, all have to be in place and geared towards the ultimate goal, which is a better experience for the tourists, whether they are business or leisure tourists. My second point is that trust is the engine for digital growth digital trade, the digital economy, and the fourth industrial revolution are all based on technologies that require trust on both sides of a transaction, be it business to consumer, business to business, government to citizen, or government to business. The ideal outcome is where consumers and firms have a common understanding of their rights and responsibilities. There needs to be a functional trust framework to take advantage of the AFCFTA. If consumers and businesses do not have trust in online transactions, then you should continue to be low. I've already made reference to the AU Digital Trade and Transformation Strategy. This shows the path to African countries to develop their IT sectors in the service of the wider economy. Coupled with the AFCFTA, it can be used to support the deepening of liberalization in critical areas required for growth of both the IT and tourism industries in Africa. So our message to African countries is to use these instruments to develop these sectors based on reform in national laws and institutional frameworks. So at the domestic level, Apart from the required infrastructure, which needs to be in place for IT systems, such as electricity, broadband, internet, etc., there needs to be in place legislation on cybercrime, data protection, including on privacy, IPRs and consumer laws and policies, laws and mechanisms to enable electronic transactions, including to give weight to electronic messages, such as email, or information on websites, uh, also to recognize electronic signatures. And then there also have to be enforcement mechanisms to back up the application of the laws, including funding for such mechanisms. All of these are part of the overall trust framework that needs to be put in place at the domestic level to take advantage of the AFCFTA and to, to roll out the trade and um, and transformation strategy that we are putting in place at the continental level. So uh, that was uh, Madame Beatrice Chato from the African Union Commission uh, sharing her uh, thoughts on this matter. We're going to uh, conclude this opening plenary session with uh, Mr. Fergus in Canada um, on, on a topic that is a trigger question actually. Uh, so uh, let's connect back to Mr. Fergus, if you're still here. Yes, you are. Um, so the last question, which uh, we are hoping you can keep very short because we are a bit um, behind time, is, you know, when we talk about tourism in Africa, museums seem quite absent from the list of attractions. Uh, indeed, most African artifacts are logged in museums outside, you know, uh, Mama Africa. Uh, bringing all these artifacts back home would first of all require adequate settings to preserve those artifacts. Digitization, you know, and digitizing them will be another thing, right? Uh, this will boost tourism in both ways, uh, traditional tourism and virtual tourism. But again, what kind of figures will such a massive project represent
from data collection to importing the precious goods back from digitizing these artifacts to making revenue out of them as tourism. Please take the floor, uh, keep it short, and okay. let's have your thoughts. Uh, uh, thanks Thank again, you. Madam Angela. That was a good intro. And, uh, you know, I'll, 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 I'll do my best to keep it short, and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll use a relative example with what I'm living with what we're living with in Canada. So often for a lot of museums, what attracts visitors to a place are the authenticity, integrity, and tangibility of the artifacts, along with a sense of place and history where it's presented, like the museum itself. Think of the Louvre or the Ricks Museum or the National Gallery in, the UK, in London, for example. And, you know, for some places, uh, like, like uh, the Louvre, it's hard to imagine the Louvre without the Mona Lisa or the Winged Venus. It's hard to imagine uh, Florence without uh, Michelangelo's statue of David in the Uffizi Gallery or the Terracotta Warriors in Xi'an in China. So again, there's very much of a very strong connection to a place of the artifact, but of the museum itself. And, you know, as I said, I was going to bring you a Canadian example, and that is Canada we have, uh, there's a considerable amount of repatriation going on right now, and that is with our indigenous peoples. And the reason uh, why that's so important is that in the 19th century, many of the cultural goods and uh, tangible artifacts of our indigenous peoples went outside of the country. It went to the United States, it went to Europe, went to France, elsewhere. And our indigenous peoples are now in the process of trying to reclaim their patrimony back, not just for the the purposes of the fact that it was created by their, the hands of their ancestors or the people who had designed, built and made these so many hundreds or thousands of years ago in some cases, but also the fact that there's a spiritual quality that's attached to it. They're not just items, but they're items that have various elements of intrinsic value that they want to see returned. So in Canada, for example, we had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, much like they did in South Africa, that ended in 2015 and, and it was one of the drivers was to repatriate and better present these cultural artifacts in Canada. There's also the United Nations declarations on the rights of, Ind of Indigenous peoples and again to use that as a driver to try and say look you know there are ways here where it's very important as a cultural right to be able to hold on to and maintain one's old one's own cultural patrimony and artifacts. So again, a very sort of important perspective. And uh, you know, in the case of uh, Canada, uh, uh, some of you might be familiar with totem poles. Uh, totem poles are a very important symbol with our West Coast Indigenous people. Uh, in the about 150 years ago, at the uh, U.S. Uh, Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia, they required or wanted a, t wanted a totem pole about 60 feet that they brought down from uh, British Columbia. And uh, British Columbia is on the west coast of Canada. And in order to get it down there, they cut it in half and then they put it on a train and sent it from uh, Vancouver to Philadelphia. And as an Indigenous friend said to me, she said, whenever I see that photo, I see my soul cut in half as well because that is my ancestors that have been lost in the cutting of that totem pole. Since then, uh, they've uh, erected, the first new pole was erected since that period in 1969 in the West Coast. And now you're starting to see artifacts being returned from outside of Canada, the United States, Europe, elsewhere, back to Canada that are various sort of elements related to indigenous peoples. As you can imagine with a 60 foot pole, like many of the cultures or many of the large artifacts for, for Ghana and for other countries uh, in Africa, it's not easy to get them back. They're very fragile. Uh, it's expensive. Uh, they've often come from climate controlled environments. And in the case of our indigenous peoples, there are very specific handling requirements as well, particularly with the spiritual aspect where there has to be an elder present so he or she can observe and make sure that all the proper protocols are being observed in the transmission of those artifacts. So to yeah. it's, it's really important to think through in terms of cost, handling, storage, reception, the training of the individuals on the other side. And then from there, how do you promote that? How do you promote the fact that this is something that has come back to Africa, has come back to the peoples of that country, 
uh, to the, the different groups that are there? And how do you promote that from a, uh, a touristic standpoint? But more importantly for me, I think as a way of retrenching the culture, the patrimony and the heritage of that cultural group or country that this is hundreds of thousands of years old artifact that's been returned. Uh, the three quick things that I could suggest as opportunities to capitalize on this are partnerships with virtual museums. You know, learn how it's done well. There's lots of good virtual museums out there. Canada certainly has them, so I'll, I'll raise the flag on that. But there are other museums in the UK or Europe that do it very well. Uh, in terms of training, interpretation, presentation, and safeguarding. How do you maintain all these hundreds of thousands of year and thousands of years old artifacts? Um, I'm also a uh, member of the International Council, and we advise UNESCO on World Heritage, and they have a scientific committee called ECOM, the International Committee on Museums. It is a very good organization that uh, helps with regulations, training, presentation, and all the necessary international standards that go into the presentation and maintenance of these different artifacts. And finally, uh, one of the key elements, and this is happening in Ghana, is to strengthen and enforce the cultural international uh, intellectual property laws regarding appropriate use and reproductions. Uh, there's been some discussion in the past with regard to the Adrinkra symbols that are very important and are very significant from a cultural standpoint across different parts of the country. But they have also been adopted or reused or captured for fashion, for design, for other purposes. And there's been some issue in terms of how you use those symbols or how you use those artifacts and if they're being interpreted or used wrongly. So again, that turns those cultural symbols or materials. There needs to be a real sensitivity in terms of not just what they are, but what they actually mean to the people whose origins they have come from, uh, their culture and their traditions. So again, a few things to think about, but really um, it is possible, the laws are there, and if it's helped by policy and laws within Ghana, this can help facilitate the return of a number of these goods because I think the time is right now to try and start bringing goods back and cultural elements back elsewhere from other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Fergus, for this uh, for these excellent points. Uh, we only have time for one comment from the Q and A session, and I'm going to uh, to to ask this to to all four of you um, or three of you. I would say uh, anyone who wants to chip in and say something, please keep it very brief, uh, under 60 seconds. And we have a comment from uh, Mr. Kweku Antwi, who says, while we are discussing all these high level points, we have to also think about digitalizing our local communities to give meaningful tourism and trade. I want to know if any of you here has uh, something to say about that. And if you do, please uh, let me know and uh, I'll give you the floor. If anyone has any comment to make, please raise your voice, yeah. Sorry, could you repeat the question? I just, I, I just it's out uh, there of the, the internet. The comment was, uh, Whilst we are discussing all these high-level points, we have to also think about digitalizing our local communities to give meaningful tourism and trade. Any comments on how to effectively digitalize local communities? Uh, th that's a very good point, and that's, uh, that's been an ongoing issue for the past 15, 20 years in terms of trying to bring smaller, more regional communities into the ecosystem. And, you know, part of it might be the fact that it's, it's training, it's platforms, it's also improving the digital backbone that's uh, outside of large urban centers. But part of it perhaps can be sort of more forward thinking in terms of a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, the, the marketing and the communications is done by mobile. So how do you do more of a mobile focus as opposed to a notebook, laptop, or a desktop focus? And you know, how are you able to develop this from a mobile network or for a formal platform? And one of the best ways is to have uh, templates. Uh, a very, you can work with different sort of uh, web design partners or social media type partners to help uh, not only convey the look and feel and information of those different sites for those different communities, but how to actually work with them to 
uh, manage visitors and how to support them to come to your community at the same time and to also show them the different things that they can immerse themselves in and to experience. Um, you know, really we use that, maximize the potential and value of those mobile platforms being used in rural areas and that are becoming increasingly popular for travelers who are going outside of the major cities. All right, thank you so very much to you, Mr. Fergus uh, McLaren. We know that you are going to stay with us for the uh, workshop session, same as Madam Esther Am Asante, who will stay with us. Uh, Caroline Kimunto, I know, um, is not part of the workshop session, uh, but welcome to stay. Uh, Beatrice Shato is not with us. This opening plenary session, we will indeed have uh, uh, the workshop session coming up very shortly. We are a bit abridged it wouldn't go all the way to 80 minutes but it would still be good um we will first have a performance from uh, our star of the day Wiala, um singing to us at the break it's a six minutes break so uh, feel free uh guests uh, audiences and distinguished speakers to refresh yourselves uh, for six minutes before we are we come back for the session on driving domestic tourism through technology and um virtual means. So uh, let's now go over to this uh, great performance uh, from uh, Wuyala, who recorded this all the way from WA for us. We are extremely grateful for this um, gesture and let's uh, give it away. For Lions of Africa, I say raw. This song is called Rock and Sun. The rock and the sun look alike, but they are for different purposes. The moral of the song is, let's not copy each other blindly. Cut our coats according to our size. Yes, and it goes like this. Keep 
Timore, 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 Well, this was uh, Wiala with uh, beautiful uh, songs. Uh, the last one called Sun and Moon and the first one called Rock and Sand. Um, well, we are going to start with uh, our workshop session now. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who is watching us live from YouTube or who is uh, joining us in this Google uh, webinar. Uh, let's catch up on the 30 minutes that we have uh, lost. So. Um, I'm sitting in for uh, your moderator, um, Madam Odelia Intiama Bwapong, who also had a, a last minute uh, emergency. Uh, so we are still here with uh, Mr. Fergus McLaren, a director of international relations and knowledge management at the Economic Innovation Institute for Africa. We are still here as well with Madam Esther Ama Asante, CEO of Organic Trade and Investment. Uh, we also have uh, Madam Joanna Diana Steele joining us all the way from the UK. She's an e-commerce strategist. Um, and uh, Simon uh, Winneloya Alangde, CEO for Winneloya Digital, uh, a Google expert. And uh, finally, Mr. Yao Pare, uh, Ghana's number one domestic tourism photographer. We will start with Mr. Yao Pare because he has to jump out uh, very soon. Um, so let's find uh, Mr. Yao Pare. Uh, among the people here on the webinar. Mr. Yao, 
How are you? Please unmute yourself. Hello, thanks, madam. I'm doing great, and you? Fantastic, great to have you on the way. Uh, we're going to jump straight into your presentation. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself to uh, the audience and uh, to start showing your slides. If you have any issue at, at your end, let me know so I can do the presentation for you. Okay. Thank you, and uh, yours. Hi, everyone. My name is Yao Pari. I'm a Ghanaian uh, photographer. Um, I'm actually a bit shocked how I got on this program, but thanks to Angela, <laughs> she forced me to get on this thing by all means necessary. Anyway, here we are. I've been doing covering Ghana um, for a bit of about maybe eight years now, taking pictures of various locations in Ghana. I wouldn't say I'm the, uh, the number one domestic photographer. <laughs> I came to meet a lot, but I guess I have had a passion to do this more, maybe more than many people are. Uh, one of the things I like to talk about real quick is uh, before we talk about digitalization um, in Ghana or in other parts of Africa, uh, some of the things that come to mind for even our domestic tourism aspect, it, we require the right training for people on the grounds uh, we need to create a system where there's an educational program for the people who are into tourism and more importantly, customer service. These are some of the three things that really need to be highlighted even before we bring in digitization because if the services are not good, uh, the places might be nice, but then it takes away from everything else. So some of these things are the main things that really need to be looked at when it comes to tourism as a whole. Uh, one of the other things that I see, which would be very great for every country, uh, especially we in Africa, to protect our resources. I think we should channel uh, our thinking into more tourism because with tourism, you can save a lot of these natural resources that we have and let people just go look at things because tourism, for instance, for France is one of the major earners for their country. We are doing this in a wrong way in terms of exploiting our resources and not giving our places a chance for tourists to come and visit, but rather depleting them and destroying them. Uh, Ghana has a lot of amazing tourism destinations. I mean, I've traveled the world in most places, I can always come back to Ghana. There are several tourism um, types in the world, close to about 63. I would say Ghana can easily take half of it. Culture, tourism, food tourism, uh, you name it. Any type of tourism that you can think about, we can have it here in Ghana. And I think as the French ambassador was saying, we should more likely to focus on uh, culture, things that we already have. Instead of focusing on things that we don't have, we should actually, the things that we have, we should magnify them and do it better than anybody. Um, our kente, for instance, uh, our culture, you know, even going to the, the chiefs and learning how, uh, uh, like we call it in tree, amamre, uh, 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 the lifestyles and things that they do that really stand out, especially when they are having events uh, for cultural entertainment or when they are ushering in a new chief and all of these things. There's so much we can learn, you know, in domestic tourism, there's so much we can also do for schools, especially now that we have the schools that are running shifts. Uh, I think if the rest are in school, the rest should be on the field learning hands-on what they are studying in the classes. So, well, what, I mean, that's, that's what most of the things that I'd like to say right now. Um, if, uh, Angela, if you can, you can show some of the pictures that I take around Ghana and showcasing Ghana to the world, basically, in a different light. I think that's one has, that has been one of the problems that we've had by not showcasing what we have 
we tend to look at what others showcase and we jump onto them. I don't think any of us traveled to another country without getting to see what was there. We travel because of things that we see, okay? So I think we need to invest more into our advertising and also that coupled with uh, how we uh, treat people, how our customer services are, would be a great uh, combination to take our tourism to the next level. So in a nutshell, please enjoy the pictures. And that's all I have to say with regards to domestic tourism. Thank you, Angela. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yap Pari, who uh, unfortunately has to leave us now. Uh, but we will continue to play the slideshow of his pictures uh, so that you can uh, you can have a look at them. Uh, on another note, you can still look at all of his wonderful pictures on his Facebook group called Random Picks um, Ghana. Ghana uh, Picks. Random Ghana Picks. Yeah, Random Picks. And you can also uh, head to his website, yaopareimages.com. So um, at this point, we are now going to move on to um, our next uh, speaker for the day. And uh, apologies uh, to uh, Madam uh, uh, Joanna Diana Steele, who has been uh, patiently waiting for her turn to jump in. Uh, remember that uh, the topic for the workshop is driving domestic tourism through technology and virtual means. So we're now going to jump over to um, Madam Joanna all the way in the UK. Uh, Joanna, please introduce yourself to uh, the people um, I see that you are already unmuted, so uh, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, we can. Uh, you are free to, uh, you know, do your uh, presentation. Let's try and keep it short because we are 30 minutes behind. Uh, so um, please keep it short, concise, and uh, let's roll. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Um, if you can let me know if you can see the presentation. Absolutely, all clear, we can see it. Please roll. Brilliant. So my name is Joanna Steele and I'm a digital marketing strategist and e-commerce consultant. Um, I'm the co-founder and director of Dymax and we're a digital consultancy that help businesses in Central and West Africa with their digital strategies to drive growth. And quite simply, I believe that um, helping African brands become the domestic and international stars of the future. Um, and I wanted to say thank you to Angela for um, inviting me on this session. It's been a fantastic couple of hours so far and I'm sure we've, we've learned a lot and there's a lot of food for thought to take away. Um, I just wanted to sort of start off by saying that um, around this time last year, I did a six month sabbatical. Um, and these are just some pictures from my travels. So I went to uh, South America, uh, Southeast Asia, and ended up in West Africa. And these images are just a snapshot of my travels. So in South America, I was in Argentina, Brazil, Peru, in Southeast Asia, I went to Malaysia, Singapore, Bali, and it was a very varied um, travel experience. Um, so I was a solo traveler. Um, I'd always wanted to travel for a long period of time um, and hadn't had the opportunity up until then. And did my travels, I did a various different things. It was about culture. It was a, about immersing myself um, with the culture, the food, and the environment, you know, I did cycling, um, you know, walking, treks, um, exposed myself to sort of the arts of the, of the different countries. And along that journey, I um, got into mountain climbing. So when I was in Peru, I climbed uh, Machu Picchu, did the Inca Trail, you know, which was like, you know, three days of trekking um, to the highest peak in Peru. Um, and it was there that I sort of found my love for mountain climbing. 
And although a lot of my trip had been planned beforehand, there was a lot of it that was quite spontaneous. Um, and so when I did the trip in Peru to the, um, did the Inca Trail, and I felt that I really enjoyed mountain climbing, I made it a, I made it a thing now to do, climb the highest peak in every country that I subsequently visited because I enjoyed that so much. So as my journey progressed, um, I climbed um, the highest peak in Malaysia, I cl um, which is Mount Kinabalu. I then proceeded to climb an active volcano when I got to Bali. Um, and then when I ended up in West Africa, I then climbed uh, Mount Afajato in um, Ghana. And again, it was a sense of, I wanted to experience all elements that the countries have to offer. Um, and it was great that I was able to experience that in Southeast, Southeast Asia, South America, and in West Africa. And I want to sort of just give you an insight into sort of my travel experiences for a number of reasons, right? Firstly, the internet played a heavy part in um, planning and organizing that trip, whether it was from initial research, whether it was from booking the trips, whether it was spontaneous activities that I wanted to do, whether it was exploring a new town, a new region, whether it was um, looking at what activities were available, the internet was an integral part of my trip. Um, I also booked some of this trip with a company called SDA Travel um, in the UK, which unfortunately over the last couple of days has fallen into administration. And I, I wanted to sort of mention that, that we are in a really critical stage um, within the tourism sector, um, where there are going to be a lot of um, sad stories, but also a lot of opportunities that we can learn from in order to take tourism um, to the next level. And I also wanted to sort of talk about sort of, you know, my journey um, being a, what I call a modern day traveller. So we're moving away from, you know, lying on the beach. Um, and actually, it's about how do you experience as much of a country as possible? How do you get a varied experience, you know, get to see the environment? Um, I did some volunteering while I was traveling as well. So there's a real emphasis of different types of tourism that are slowly sort of immersed slowly coming out and from various different countries, you know, eco-tourism, volunteering, et cetera, as well as finding out about the culture and the food. And then finally, I wanted to also sort of tell you about the reason why I wanted to talk to you about my journey was that um, when I climbed Mount Afajado, I did it with native Ghanaians um, who'd never done it before. And I'd asked them the question, you know, well, why had you not done it? And, wh and why did you decide to sort of do the climb with me? And the answer was, I saw, you know, all the amazing things that you've done, all the mountains that you climbed throughout your trip. And it really encouraged me. I wanted to have that kind of same experience. And so I, that's why I came along with you. And so I tell you that story because I think it's really important to understand the, um, the importance of using um, what we call user-generated content. So that's understanding and hearing about other people's experiences and then wanting to experience those yourself. So if you are a tour company and you're trying to encourage people to come to um, an activity or an attraction site, for example, it's really important to use the experiences of other customers to help tell your story as to why tourists should be visiting your, your destination. And it's really important to understand the customer. And when we're talking about digital and tech, you know, fundamentally, what do your customers want? What does the modern day traveler want? As I mentioned, it's about ecotourism. How can I enjoy a country in a sustainable way? Um, how can I do some good while I'm traveling? How can I volunteer? Um, and that must reflect in your messaging, in your communication and the channels that you use as well. And I think um, Ghana and Africa, um, other countries in Africa really stand a chance of, of sort of catering to that new modern traveller, particularly when we're talking about the rural areas that exist um, across the continent. Um, it's really important that, you know, websites, I talked about the internet was an integral part of how I sort of booked and planned my trip. Um, and I think largely across the continent, what we're seeing is a lot of websites are still very much informational. 
You know, they're not transactional, they're not interactive. You know, you're not finding them with particular keywords. So I think there needs to be a real focus on how we can make those websites a bit more um, transactional, a bit more interactive. So people can do, you know, bookings online um, and get to view, you know, customer photos and really understand what that activity or what that attraction is all about. And we should also focus on data. Um, how are we able to collect data so that we can offer a personalized or a customized experience for our travelers? Um, whether it's based on your budget, whether it's based on, you know, whether you're a solo traveler, whether you travel with your families, you know, whether you're going to a certain location, really understanding what that trip is all about. Um, and getting that data means that we're able to then create experiences um, and customize trips um, for the modern day traveler. And mobile is, is massively important, right? Um, travel is inherently mobile. And so, you know, I, I traveled with my mobile the whole time, whether it was to research, whether it was to book. And we know across the continent, mobile penetration is upwards of 80%. So how can we leverage that technology um, and mobile devices to really um, cater um, to the new modern traveler? You know, when we're talking about tech, um, you know, there's some fantastic things going on out there around augmented reality, you know, virtual reality, mixed reality, enhancing, um, you know, experiences in museums or other attraction sites, given that element of allowing customers to sort of try before they buy. Um, and all of that new stuff is fantastic. Um, and it's here. And I think there's definitely opportunity for, for um, businesses within Africa to leverage some of those new technologies. Um, but I think it's really important to, to consider getting the basics right. So we can talk about these fantastic technologies and they definitely need to become an integral part of how um, tourism works um, across the world. Um, but let's understand about getting the basics right. You know, let's keep the tourist sites well maintained. You know, um, merchandise, I found a, a lot of my experiences um, within Ghana, there wasn't any merchandise, you know, how are we upselling, how are we making more money um, um, with, with, with tourism? Things like um, opening hours, again, not very clear, not very many attractions had Google My Business pages. So I think there's a few things that can be done um, with some of the basics before we sort of leapfrog ahead into um, things like AR, VR, et cetera. Um, and I think finally, I think what's really key, obviously, being within sort of, you know, the pandemic um, and the uncertainty that sort of, um, you know, is, is surrounding us is I think it's important, whether it's domestic tourism or international tourism, to reassure um, customers, reassure travellers, you know, um, bring back that confidence and comfort. So what are you doing as, um, as a site? to reassure customers you know what safety measures are you doing um you know hygiene um what, what's happening there i think there's a lot of things that we can do um using technology you know we've talked about perhaps robots um helping people with hotel check-ins and um, there's stories around robots um sort of cleaning um hotel rooms and minimizing that human contact um you know wearable tech um, which allows you to sort of track your movements within a particular um, site so that you can measure sort of visitor flow and where there might be high levels or high concentrations of people within a site. So there are things in which we can really sort of focus on um, and where technology can definitely help us, particularly around this time where, you know, providing confidence um, to, uh, to travellers is really important um, and making them feel assured that when they're travelling, that they're travelling safely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Um, Madam Joanna, I think uh, those are great points that uh, attraction site owners can really uh, leverage on. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, please stay on the line with us because we are having comments coming in in the Q&A, which will be addressed to you. So um, we will be uh, taking on those uh, comments and we'll be looking forward to you answering them. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to go to um, our um, other speaker in the in this workshop, um, Simon, Mr. Simon Alangde, CEO of Winneloya Digital. Um, 
Google expert uh, here in Ghana. Uh, Mr. Simon, thank you for your, um, for your patience. Thank you for being here. And thank you also for helping us, you know, uh, fix internet connection issues, which were, were distracting our viewers on YouTube. A reminder that the YouTube feed is back up, is streaming smoothly. Please go on YouTube, stream at Cot Live, drop your comments so that we can uh, share them in this Q&A with our speakers. Anyways, Mr. Simon, thank you for being here and uh, roll away with your presentation, which I believe is uh, on, uh, you know, uh, technology and uh, cyber security. Um, thank you very much, uh, Angela, for the introduction and um, great uh, presentation from Joanna. Um, it's an honor joining all of you um, from Ghana. I'm here in Ghana. I realize most of you are in, across Africa and some, of course, outside Africa. Um, technology within the uh, tourism industry is quite, uh, is very imperative. Um, it's, it's, it's something that you cannot do without based on the demand and the, the current situations across the world. So um, I'm just going to jump straight into my, uh, my slides and I will share with you um, how we can help uh, you can, as a business, as a business in tourism or a business in travel. Um, just to let you know, once we talk about uh, tourism, we also talk about travel. So um, if you hear me talk about travel, then I'm also trying to talk about tourism. Okay, so um, Angela, I believe you can see my screen. Um, Absolutely, you. see it. Thank you. Please roll okay. on. Great. So um, yes, uh, my name is Simon Wiloya Langde. Uh, I'm a digital skill strategist and um, and to cloud migration as well. Um, so basically, Angela uh, Joanna has said so many things in terms of how to you know bring your business online and. Uh, how businesses should leverage AR and all of those uh, different technologies. I will talk, of course, something similar to that, but uh, my approach will talk about, I will delve more into the customer journey and the experience and how to be there in that moment of the journey. So first of all, to drive dom domestic tourism through technology or virtual means, you need to know who a digital customer is. You need to prioritize the customer journey experience you need to monitor the tools or the trends within your industry or uh, in the te technology uh, ecosystem. And then, of course, you have to rethink your messaging and your targeting strategies because of the current situations and, of course, based on the trends that you have monitored. And then uh, I'll the last thing I'll talk about is to how, how to improve your digital hygiene. Uh, what are the things that you can help yourself uh, in terms of personal branding, in terms of how to be on top of uh, digital uh, topics or uh, issues in terms of your industry. Okay, so of course, uh, if you are trying to bring your business uh, or to leverage technology for your tourism business or your business in the travel industry, uh, that means that you are bringing your business online and you are leveraging digital business. And therefore, um, ideally, the, the, in, the customers you're going to be interacting with, we call them the digital customer. Now, there are certain attributes or certain um, school of thoughts about who they are. And uh, I'll just mention a few of them. A digital customer focuses on innovation. A digital customer insists on convenience. They're always connected and they lack brand loyalty. It does not mean that they don't love brand loyalty programs, but they lack brand loyalty. I will explain all of this as I progress. Um, Angela has uh, reminded me that um, I have to be a bit quick because of the time that I've spent so far. So a digital customer focus on uh, certain things when it comes to digitalization. And when we say you are, bringing your, you are leveraging technology for the uh, tourism industry, you have to first understand that your business or what uh, you, are, you are getting to, they should be relevant. So knowing who your customer is and where they are in their purchase journey, knowing who the customer is. And, and of course, as I said, I would talk more about knowing who your customer is and then the purchase journey or the customer journey. Then you have to understand that uh, to, in order to leverage digital, they, you must ensure that it's easy for you to find or book simple. Uh, it, must, it must be easy for customers to book or find easy uh, information about your business. So therefore, convenience. Um, even uh, in that convenience, you should understand that speed in its own self can stand alone, in the sense that 53% of users leave mobile sites that 
take longer than uh, three seconds to load. So this should be certain uh, uh, top priorities in terms of how you should, uh, when you're leveraging digital platforms, what you should think about when you're on these digital platforms to promote your tourism or your business. Now, what are those customer uh, journey or the movements that you should consider when you are looking at bringing your business online or leveraging um, technology or virtual means for a tourism business? One, um, there's a school of thought that we call the zero moment of truth, right? That talks about the micro movements to, uh, from the, uh, the brand awareness to the, uh, the final purchase in terms of from a customer's uh, seeing your brand and actually deciding to buy your product. There are certain uh, micro movements within that customer journey, and that, that's what I'm going to talk to you about. One, I want to watch what I am to moments. This is the moment where the customer is, is watching what, uh, is, is, is looking out for useful information, information that is relevant to that customer at that point. At that point, the customer is not looking for uh, something to buy, but he's just watching what uh, is useful to uh, uh, himself or herself. The second one is I want to know moments. This is the part that the customer uh, is also looking for uh, local businesses. I want to know, sorry, it's in search for local businesses around and to know information, information that uh, he has seen somewhere. He has, let's, let's say that he has seen your video, your, your ad on TV. He's trying to, you know, basically search more about your brand. So they either go to social, social media like Facebook to search about your brand or even to go on Google search. Of course, Google search is the first thing they'll think about. But of course, we're in a digital ecosystem, so there are other platforms they might go. So the question is, are you there when they want to know more about your brand? And then I want to go movements. I want to go movement is when they are looking for businesses near them based on their radios. So um, hotels near me, restaurants near me, swimming pools near me. Uh, so these are, these are the things that uh, your customer will be looking for and that in those micro movements. Are you there when they're looking for those things, in the, uh, when they're in that stage of uh, uh, thoughts? Then I want to do movements. These are, this is the, the, the time that the customer is basically looking for how to. So we have the how to videos, how to, how to uh, maintain your house during uh, lockdown, uh, how to stay healthy during the lockdown, basic things that they can do, you know, to do themselves. So the, so the how to videos, what do you have uh, content that is available to keep your customers, you know, remember your brand, content marketing, to understand that, uh, to we, we call that kind of um, content marketing influence consideration. They might not actually be, uh, your how to video is not a sell video, but when they are looking for your a service that you sell, they'll think about you because they remember your brand when they were uh, watching those videos. Then there's the actual purchase period, which you call, I want to buy moments. So these are different, uh, the different school of thought about the micro movements to which uh, the customer is always in when he's trying to buy a product from the uh, brand awareness to the purchase product. So when you understand these different customer journey movements, you'll be able to position your brand in these different uh, segments to um, be able to be there for the customer to leverage or to make that purchase of your products. So once you understand the micro movements for your client, you know that, or your customer, you know that you're, of course, uh, even within all of this, you have to have a, a profile of your customer. So you know your customer is within this age group, the avatar, and then you know that typically, if your your customer because of the age group and then the 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 the, the job brackets or the income uh, of that customer, they will literally be uh, watching news at this time. They will visit these websites, so you would be able to know the platforms and the kind of messaging to send to them in these different micro moments. And then of course, you have to monitor the trends. What is happening? What is happening around your industry? Um, what words are travelers uh, or people within Ghana or out of Ghana searching for uh, about your business? So for example, if they're searching for, uh, uh, if you type the word Ghana in a platform like Google Trends, so you can go to trends.google.com trends and you search for Ghana and you can choose a location like the United States or Italy, any place you think your customers will be there. What are the words they are searching about, about Ghana or about your location, whether in Cape Coast or you're in Mugua, what are the things they're searching about? Maybe they're searching for hotels or they're searching for uh, experiences to do in these locations. Based on these trends, you can also begin to build content 
to drive traffic to your uh, tourism site. So you have to begin to monitor trends. You can even be beyond using platforms like Google Trends, you can use a simple tool like Google Alerts. That even allows you to get alerts based on certain topics of your choice, right? So for example, uh, let's say that uh, your, your brand name, you can have alerts for your brand name. Anytime your brand name is being mentioned or Google picks up information about your brand name, if it's seeable or searchable on Google search, Google would show that uh, brand name uh, will send a notification to your email address for that brand name. And you can even get it as frequent as anytime it pops up or weekly or monthly, depending on your, your settings. So there are different platforms that you can monitor uh, the trends, either in your industry or about the digital customer. So even if you know the, your, your customer, your avatar, the ideal customer that you're looking for, then you can begin to create these uh, trends. You know, you can even monitor, as uh, Joanna said, you can use uh, Google Analytics uh, data platforms to, of course, understand your current customers. And once you know, you, you build a strong profile of your current customer. Using that profile, you could use the technology platforms to get more customers like your current customer, right? So this is a simple way. And of course, what, what you should know about the digital platform is that once you're able to target correctly and you narrow your, your targeting, whether it's you're running ads or you're uh, basically building content, able to narrow the, 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 the content you are giving out and the, 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 the profile you have, you spend less in terms of even running ads, right? You spend less because you are reaching out to people that actually are looking for your business or are trying to find uh, services that you um, sell or provide. So when you are, of course, now you know, you know your, your ideal customer, you know their customer, you know their uh, customer journey in terms of the micro moments, you understand how to monitor the trends. Another thing you should think about is now that we're in this early stages of recovery or post-COVID or within COVID, you should rethink your strategy, right? And why am I saying that? Because travel is now a priority for most customers post-lockdown. People are thinking, and this is a, a, a research from Google, that uh, 2020 uh, May, that 45% of people uh, who had delayed in vacations due to COVID-19 are prioritizing booking as a vacation or trip after the pandemic. So basically, people are seriously waiting and searching. They are, they are in the moments, they are in the I want to know moments. They are in the, uh, the that moments where they're looking for useful information. So the question is, what are you doing in anticipation uh, of, of that post-COVID uh, uh, pandemic period? And another thing you should understand is that the cost, the customer is the, the mindset is changing, right? Uh, people are also and just like this, um, what do you call it? This workshop, people are thinking about domestic um, travel. Local people are trying to explore their environment. So people are planning for the next three months, the next within the next three months, what can they do? So what content do you have for them to do things within the next three months, within the, the shortest possible time? What are you, what content is available? So you should focus on things like near me. And the near me campaigns, is it sounds as simple, but it can be as robust as you want it. So when we say a near me campaign, we mean as basic as um, a tour guide near me, a tour guide in uh, Dansuma, or it can be as simple as a restaurant uh, near me. Now, you can have a big hotel, you can have a small hotel, but you can segment these different products or services you have right into different near me campaigns because of course post covid your initial campaign was the hotel because that's where you, you're making more revenue from but now you can segment the near me campaigns for walk-ins for to the restaurants so the restaurant alone can be a near me campaign for people to walk into your restaurant even though you are a full flesh hotel but you want because of the covid situation you are trying to get more people within your uh, radios to visit your, your location. So you, you, you build more content on social media about near me campaigns uh, for people within your lo lo uh, radios or uh, your demographic areas. Um, you can also build near me campaigns. Of course, the ideal one is, uh, John also mentioned it, but uh, Google My Business Listing, so, which is free. So all these things are free, which is free. So you can have these different uh, campaigns to ensure that once they search for um, 
your services near them or your services in your geographical areas, Google will recommend your business because you have opted for such a, a form of, uh, let me say, promotion. Okay. So, as I said, I, I have to rush through all of this because uh, I've been prompted about the time. But another thing you should consider is your digital hygiene. Uh, without a digital mindset, you cannot run a digital uh, tourism or you cannot promote your, uh, you cannot leverage technology or virtual means for your business. You don't have a digital mindset. If you, if, if you, if you, if you personally feel like digital is too difficult, you will spend so much money. So many people will come to you with solutions that you could have actually worked on yourself or uh, you could have done in-house, but because you, you are refusing to have the digital mindset, you lose from that, uh, that, that game or that, uh, yes, let me just say the game for lack, of, for lack of a better word. So you have to leverage and build your digital uh, hygiene, uh, subscribe to different tourism uh, platforms, uh, join uh, different groups or uh, school of thoughts about uh, digital uh, products and how to leverage digital with your ecosystem. Um, journal, again, uh, as I said, because it's a workshop, um, we, when we all speak on the same topic, of course, different speakers will mention similar products. So, for example, the VR that, uh, uh, AR and VR that uh, Joanna mentioned, you can leverage a free one that is from Google. So, for example, there's one called uh, arv.google.com. Um, I'll, I'll, send, I'll send these links to Angela to share with everyone after this presentation. And of course, if you need to reach out to me, you can reach out to me, mail at uh, my name, swalangde.com. But basically, if you're leveraging sometimes, and this is a free, like creating a virtual toy is free. The platform is there, all you need is a mobile phone. Of course, if you wanted to be more creative, you can engage someone who is good in these things to you know build that for you. But if you're a startup, you could try it yourself and see how it works for your business, right? And these are free, and these are tools that are available for you. So you have to, uh, within this, uh, at least even as we are in the early uh, recovery stages of COVID, you still have to build uh, that mindset, that digital hygiene. So that's basically what I have for today. Um, because of the time, I, I could not dive deep into all of them. But yes, I'm open to questions. And uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Excellent, Mr. Simon. Thank you so much for this free lecture. Um, please stay on the line with us uh, because we will be having some comments from, um, from, from people uh, regarding all that you shared. Uh, we're going to jump back to Canada with uh, Mr. Fergus, uh, who, will, um, who will have a presentation to show to us. Uh, but please, we are running out of time. We have to close at 1 p.m. to so try and keep it as short as possible uh, so that we can be uh, on time because we also have the closing ceremony coming up. Um, so Mr. Fergus, still on the line. Can you hear us? I can. Thank you for the reminder about the time. That's, that's very, uh, very I, will, I, will, I will do my best to do so. Thank you. Please run away with your okay. presentation. This is. Uh, let's see. Sorry, I'll just get to it. No problem. A reminder that you are watching the Africa Digitization Conference on Tourism and Trade. We are streaming it live from the NDPC, National Development Planning Commission. We are grateful to them for uh, giving us their conference room to carry out this event um and we still have fergus on the line mr fergus are you through with your presentation and are you ready to go it seems like we've lost mr fergus um or like his feet is frozen uh so while this is uh, happening uh let's see if our other speaker madame uh, esther asanti is still Mr. Fergus, please mute yourself. We will get back to you in some time uh, when all of this is resolved. You might want to log out and log back in. Um, so we will be back um, connecting to Canada very soon. Uh, Madam uh, Esther, uh, we want to know if you are still with us. 
Yeah, I'm still with you. Please, please, please. Fantastic. Um, so we, as we were talking about, you know, solutions uh, to drive uh, domestic tourism um, through digital means, you know, um, you, you had some points to make when it comes to how can tourism become attractive to citizens and not only to foreigners and and um this is something that is the case not just in ghana but also in some other african countries so please go away and uh you know take the floor and uh get give us solutions uh at a local and also continental level thank you thank you very much Angie. i'm going to keep this very short um so actually i based on my own experience um, some, from someone who grew up in Europe and um, returned to uh, Ghana and um, I didn't know much about my own country. Um, it looks like everyone was focusing on leaving Ghana and going to experience other uh, countries in Europe and I was always shocked. So what we did is um, we made it a point that every year we, we would focus on one region in Ghana and then um, discover that region. And I think the problem we are having with domestic um, tourism in Ghana or in Africa is, is uh, our, uh, our mindset. Um, I think we must not uh, downplay the importance of the um, domestic tourism because this sector can reduce poverty by generating employment and, and the remote areas and, and in communities and improve infra infrastructure and in these regions, for instance. So um, the change of mindset is very important. Um, it starts with we cherishing whatever we have, our culture, our tradition. In Africa, um, we have a lot of um, languages, over 200 languages spoken in Ghana, for instance, and I can barely speak only one. So this is already a wealth that we have to um, cherish and and um, be grateful for educating people on their culture and whether um, whatever items that are unique to that uh, respect like we have to change the narrative and this is where children can learn about our own history and instead of having people writing our history then we rest with ourselves and the mystic tourism should be part of our storytelling so how do we promote um, the communities and emphasize on their culture, traditions, languages, foods? And we have to run promotional campaigns. And I like the fact that Simon was uh, emphasizing on uh, how to promote an area through digitalization. And this is exactly what we have to do. In Ghana today, we have about um, 3.4 million Ghanaians that um, always on, on social media. We can use that platform to advertise, to run campaigns on a certain region, and it will, it will be free. It just um, attracting the the um, the, the um, um, attention to go to that region. Um, another thing that I think we should do is to promote um, the detailed map uh, for tourists because that, that is one of the challenges uh, we faced and we didn't have when we were trying to. Um, plan a, a trip to a region in Ghana, um, so we have to end up doing it all by ourselves. Well, it wasn't really fun, but uh, we had no other um, way of doing it, um, no other option. Um, so placing them in, in um, we can have that kind of um, detailed map for tourists, and we can place these uh, map in, in, a, to, in the bars, restaurants, hotels, and malls, for everyone to see. So showcasing whatever we have, like other speakers have already emphasized on that idea or aspect, we cannot do away with our culture and who we are. It's our story. And another thing I want to emphasize on is what COVID has shown us or has taught us is the importance of partnership. Um, our small um, artisans must be part of the domestic ecosystem um, domestic um, um, tourism ecosystem. Let's say we do share butter in a in a um, um, area such as uh, Tamale. Already, the name Tamale it has a history, a background history, which means 
the, the town of Share. So if I'm getting to that kind of town, I'll inspect that, I'll go and see the share butter, uh, people who are producing share butter and all those things. So if we bring them together on a same platform, and this is where we are also promoting other people to know more about our, our culture, ourselves. And this is just for Ghana. But after Ghana, we also have regions, um, the Francophone regions, and, and, and even Eastern Africa. We don't know those parts. Um, of, of uh, the countries or Africa and the continent. So I think first and foremost, changing the mindset is, is the main focus here and to understand that, that we have great things in Africa, like Yawa Pari um, told us and with beautiful pictures, really keeping it simple and that is the way forward. So just, I'm just keeping it simple because of time factor. Thank you. Well, absolutely um, excellent points made. Let's try to head back to uh, Mr. Fergus. Um, Mr. Fergus, okay. if you're still here. Yeah. Fine. I, I am. I'll try. I'll try the presentation again. Thanks for your patience. Excellent. <laughs> so, um, looks like you have your presentation set. If there are any um, issues at your end, I could try playing this at my end, but um, I believe you will be able to sort that out. Let me know if there's anything. Uh, you seem to freeze. Are you able to still hear us, Mr. Fergus? Okay, it appears that Mr. Fergus has um, again been lost. Uh, if we can at least hear you speak, um, you could comment on the on the slides, and I could run them for you. Let me know if that's something you could do. Um, otherwise, in the meantime, what we'll do is uh, we'll just um, start taking uh, questions. If you could uh, start, if you could run the slides for me, that'd be great because I seem to be having some issue with them on my Google service. Yes. All right. Per perfect. Okay. So, Thank you. Um, you clearly um oh we can't even see you all right <laughs> so okay. um i'm just to uh open your file uh your presentation and then we will uh, run with that right away uh Thank so you. a reminder that uh, you are watching the uh africa digitization conference on tourism and uh trade so let's see if we can finally get lucky with uh, mr fergus uh, presentation Yes, we can. Excellent. There we go. Okay. So, uh, first off, uh, uh, and for accommodating me and for uh, this presentation, and essentially, just wanted to give you a quick overview in terms of VR, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, and how it could be applied in tourism, and a an example that would be applicable for what's hap what could be applied in Ghana and elsewhere in Africa. So if you go to the next slide, please. So to, just go to, back to Ubisoft, go back to the one above. No, go back up. Yep. Yeah. So um, I live in uh, Canada, as you know. And we live uh, on the road from Montreal, where the arm of Ubisoft, uh, which is a French company, and produces a number of uh, video games that some of you might be familiar with if you have kids or if they are interested in esports. One of their most uh, popular games, next slide, please, is uh, Assassin's Creed. Uh, there are about uh, 12 versions of the game, and the eighth version is one that's called Unity. And one of the things that Ubisoft does is that they are very, very good in terms of digital thing, in terms of their uh, games to make it as accurate and representative as possible. Uh, this game came out in uh, 2014 after a year and a half of doing the digitizing and the referral and the information. Next slide, please. Last April, uh, on the 15th and 16th of the month, uh, there was a terrible, tragic fire in Notre Dame. And Notre Dame, of course, is uh, part of the Paris uh, Banks of the Seine World Heritage Site. 
but is also uh, this is one of the iconic symbols of the city. And of course, many watched in horror as this uh, site uh, burned down. And so there was a curiosity in terms of what can we do in terms of how we rebuild it properly and where we get the information from. Well, one of the great things is, is that Ubisoft had all the digital information that they needed. And for the restoration and the reparation of that site, next site, next uh, slide, please. The uh, French authorities, you have been using the digital information that uh, Ubisoft has on hand to begin the restoration of this very important structure that is not only important from a uh, spiritual and cultural standpoint for the French, but it is also one of the prime destinations and symbols for tourism in the country. And uh, to top it off, the uh, Ubisoft also gave a half uh, million euros to help with the restoration. So again, it's about the power of digital, but how it can also support uh, the restoration of these different sites. So let's, next slide, please. So just for those who might not be aware what the difference between uh, virtual reality and augmented reality is, uh, virtual reality is the immersive community generated uh, simulation uh, where a person can take part in a 3D environment using goggles or some other such devices to feel like you're in something. Think of the holodeck that you used to see on uh, Star Trek, for example. And then augmented reality are computer generated visualiz visualizations that enhance the sense of the real world around us or merge the real and virtual together. So you can have overlays, you can have things where you can turn your car into a horse visually, or you can uh, uh, imagine something there that there's a digital overlay for it. Next slide, please. So why use virtual reality, augmented reality and tourism? It can help simulate tourism experiences anyone with enough money could experience for real. So especially in this time of COVID, where you might want to explore a place or think about a place where you'd want to travel uh, once we've emerged out of this uh, COVID sort of nightmare. Uh, there's an opportunity to actually sense what a place is about, the things you can see and do there, and really get a general feel for it. VRR can also create experiences that are not or ordinarily feasible. You can take a magic carpet ride over a crop, or you could. Uh, uh, be in an ancient Viking ship uh, like with Game of Thrones somewhere in the North Sea. It's a way where you can place yourself in an environment that, you know, is otherworldly. Finally, you know, it can help people in this time of COVID to surmount travel restrictions and control the experience of the rest of the world. So again, to really open up your eyes where many of us have been sequestered in our homes. Challenges of using this sort of uh, system. Uh, virtual holiday, you know, it's not the same as being there in a place. You can't really taste the food. You can't really get the senses and smells of a place. Uh, there's a high production investment and quality capacity that's required by national tourism organizations, destination management organizations, and tour operators. It's a lot of time, money, and effort that's required there. Uh, a lot, some of these require high bandwidth, Wi-Fi, and uh, uh, different sorts of elements that allow tourists to use it. And finally, Finally, you know, software, hardware, and content get old very quickly. So there has to be real sort of investment in terms of, uh, you know, updating the product, updating the information, and trying to make those things that are unique in terms of uh, providing those different elements for that site. Next slide, please. So the opportunities. You know, you can, you can place people into a compelling and engaging storytelling that's really immersive in terms of how you think about a place and the different sort of thing that you, you know create that excitement of turning as i say turning lookers into bookers people who really you know they see they appreciate and they understand and they make that decision you know that's where i want to travel to next um there's a scalable yet engaging content tools valuation research and infrastructure that can really help in terms of the information of customization and scalability that can start addressing those groups of uh, clients or customers who really start to feel or understand that this is a destination that they want to travel to. And finally, you can begin to start showcasing destinations and amenities, the places, places that are around there uh, to recreate them 
uh, some places have even started to go as far as using wind and aromas and other sort of scents and other things to build that attraction or sense of place uh, in conjunction with the VR, AR that's there. So a real sort of fully sensory experience. Next slide, please. One of the, one of the uh, organizations that I've been working with is a firm around of mine called Pancage Manchanda, and it's uh, referred to as Og Traveler. And it was a finalist in the 2019 uh, Indian Innovation uh, Startup Camp for World Tourism Forum Lucerne. So it's very high level and a very unique sort of product in terms of uh, uh, the digitiz digitization that he's done to do an augmented reality representation of Indian World Heritage sites in major cities like Jaipur, Delhi, and Agra. And these are some of the images of it just below. Next slide, please. One of the key things that it focuses on are the sustainable development goals. So much like the ADCOT logo that has the O represented as the 17 different goals of the 17 uh, for the sustainable development goals, the Og Traveler focuses on three specific goals, uh, cultural heritage, education, and economic development. And the five key elements that, uh, the, the, uh, the four key elements that I focus on are immersive travel experiences, um, and ha having really enriching cultural walks and trails, uh, enabling com community employability, but also small, medium enterprise business development to tie into this platform and also to enrich school students' experiences. So adding into the local, regional, and national curriculum from not only a, an information standpoint, but a visual and uh, experiential standpoint. So to really make that learning and education stick for that culture. Next slide, please. So this is what the, uh, the experience is, you know, uh, you can align with uh, basically cultural heritage. So it's essentially, it's using the mobile platform, as I said in my one of my earlier presentations, it is really, you know, it's becoming the key digital instrument for people to use to get in and around different sites. And it actually allows you to explore these sites where you can walk around and you can point it or direct yourself within that site. And it gives you a brief interpretation of the history aspect and important nature of those different elements within those sites. Uh, here, one of the images shows the Taj Mahal, which of course is one of India's most important cultural sites. Next slide, please. So there are also cultural roots. So to this end, around a major site like the Taj Mahal or Agra Fort in Delhi, or some of the forts in uh, Jaipur, for example, there's an ecosystem of businesses that might be uh, craft makers or artisans or restaurants or hotels. And so there is an ability on this device, not only for the site itself to give you a tour of it, but also as uh, Simon said before, a near me element to it. So what are the things when you are visiting a site as an independent traveler where you can find authentic crafts, authentic food, uh, of artisans that are nearby, then you can get a fuller sense of the history and culture of that place. And so, really, sort of uh, multi layered in terms of the benefits to tourism that can be accrued from the platform. Uh, next page, please. In terms of the uh, for education, Og Traveler has gone as far as to partner with two of the leading educational publishers in the world, uh, Macmillan and Springer, and they have basically used a high standard of curriculum that they sort of mode and platform to convey this information. And at the same time, one that tends to stick more in terms of the information and how it's presented from a visual and uh, appreciation standpoint. Next uh, page, please. So uh, Og Traveler has a number of partners. We've mentioned already uh, McMahon and uh, they have there's uh, two key ones there are Decathlon and TripAdvisor. So Decathlon is one of the biggest uh, sporting goods uh, stores in the uh, in the world and based in India, but they also have a very big athletic community around it. So 
using this Aug Traveler device. They are working with Decathlon to help them in terms of trails, in terms of training, in terms of all those other different aspects for people who are traveling from different countries wanting to get involved with sports tourism or sporting activities. And in the case of TripAdvisor, which many of you know, can actually go walking around to various sites. And if you see something that you want to find out more about uh, food that's nearby, if you want to go eat or if you want to stay somewhere nearby, you click on the TripAdvisor uh, and it shows what the review is. And then it shows again, if you click on it near me, then what it will do is it'll show you the actual Aug Traveler information that encourages local economic benefit and jobs as well. So, and you see the different levels below, business to business, business to consumer, institutional, e-commerce. There's all kinds of levels where there can be a connection through this digital plan and economic benefit. So really it's a, it's a platform, but it's ultimately customizable. And if you're a tour operator or if you're someone who's a business that wants to get into that ecosystem, you can customize those platforms around that site to add different businesses or other opportunities to generate revenue or participation in the ecosystem. Next slide, please. So the key experience, key things that the Aug Traveler can resolve is a quality experience. Uh, you know, you know, well curated information that's in your hands and that you can access very quickly. It's accessible, so accessible for a number of uh, people of different backgrounds and different levels of interest, and also people who might be you know older or disabled who don't necessarily have those kinds of opportunities to see this kind of information or to participate in this touristic activity. Um, and it also, as I mentioned before, community benefits in terms of jobs and other sorts of ecotourism, uh, sorry, ecosystem uh, benefits that are there for the different businesses in and around these important cultural and natural sites. Next slide, please. They can also, um, again, the other four issues, they can do customization. So again, uh, you can customize it for the destination, but you can also customize it, of course, for the visitor, for what uh, she or he is looking for as they travel around a place and uh, you know, uh, the different areas, interests that can feed into how they can get the most out of a destination. Their strong educational focus that I mentioned before, um, it is scalable and it can be used, uh, you know, you can place different layers for a site, for a region, for a country. And certainly there are opportunities within Africa to use this type of technology as well. Uh, and finally, engagement. Um, one of the things that they've tried to do is that to actually draw younger people into it. They've gamified uh, some of the treasure hunt tours where you can actually get people to explore a site or a destination and bring them to different places around that site through the use of gaming much like uh, people used to do with Human Gold, for example. But this is more treasure-oriented where there are small gifts or rewards that you get for going to the site or destination to understand it more and purchase things along the way in some instances. So in conclusion, uh, we shouldn't be aspiring to go back to normal. We should be uh, reimagining what normal means. Uh, of course, after last year's successful year of return, uh, there was much promise uh, in December with the Beyond the Return program. Of course, uh, uh, COVID has had its impacts on it, but they were to look at that Beyond the Return program and infuse it with these new digital opportunities, digital means to help drive the visitor economy forward as Ghana and other countries recover. Next slide, please. So Medasi, uh, many thanks. Uh, and my information is there. If you'd like more information about the work we do with the Economic Innovation Institute for Africa and also about Aug Traveler, I'd be happy to connect you more with information on that. Many thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, this presentation. Another great one. We've had fantastic presentations at this uh, at uh, program. Um, anyways, we are nearing the end of this show. Um, so what we're going to do right now is uh, take some uh, questions and comments from uh, from uh, the people following us on, on YouTube and uh, on this uh, webinar. Uh, and it has to be a bit quick because at 45, we're done. So we basically have like seven minutes to um, to go through this. 
I'm going to read a few comments. Uh, I believe I saw uh, some. <clears throat> okay, somebody um, addressing themselves to uh, Madam Joanna said, uh, how can I connect with regards to consultancy for uh, my own uh, business? Um, and um, somebody else said, I've discovered many new places in Ghana thanks to your power platforms. Indeed, domestic tourism is so, so important. Uh, I'm going to give um, uh, the opportunity to Madam Joanna to say one last word uh, before we close this. And then um, also later on, uh, Madam Esther Santi, if she wants to add something, uh, Mr. Simon Alangde and Yao Pari uh, have left um, due to our other commitments, uh, but we were very pleased to have them um, on the webinar. Uh, so, uh, Madam Joanna, if you're still with us, uh, your final comments on um, on, on these workshops and, and those topics. Thank you. Um, if anyone wants to connect with me, I am on LinkedIn um, and my website address is dimaxdigital.com. Um, I think I just kind of wanted to sort of close by saying that, you know, tourism, domestic tourism can be attractive for citizens. Um, and there are a number of different ways in which that can be can be done. Um, I think there should definitely be a focus on events that instill national pride, um, that bring people together in some way, virtually or otherwise, around music um, and sports. Um, and really, I suppose, tap into the idea of helping people to discover um, their local area or um, a region that they're not familiar with. I think Esther mentioned it um, earlier when she said, you know, we proactively were intentional about selecting an area that we were unfamiliar with and exploring it. So I think, you know, humans, we are just generally quite inquisitive um, and we want to find something new. And if we tap into that human element to um, help people discover sort of new areas and generate excitement um, around discovering hidden beauties, I think that's going to be key to drive domestic tourism. Um, and really tapping into how you can relive nostalgic moments, um, um, et cetera. I think as well, strategic partnerships are key. Um, you know, the tourism industry is so interlinked with various different industries, you know, airline companies, um, independent tour operators, um, you know, hospitality, you know, all of those different sectors. I think it's really important now, um, more than ever, to kind of collaborate and work together. Um, and that will help bolster each of those um, economies individually, industries individually, and sort of have an overarching um, impact um, on the economy of, of the country. Um, and I think as well, some of the things that we should look at is how we can entice um, citizens to participate in domestic tourism. So whether it's special offers, um, you know, bundled packages, um, discounts for families, um, things that I think would really sort of help drive, um, you know, domestic tourism. Um, and really, I think leverage, I, I think I mentioned this before, but people buy into people. It's about people's experiences. Um, and I think share content um, that comes from um, customers who have used your services and use your customers to sell your services on your behalf and really promote that. You know, whether it's on your social media channels, whether it's on your own websites, um, whether it's brochures um, that you um, put together, but really let the experiences of your customers um, sort of sell sell your 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 proposition to other customers. Um, and thank you. Wow, great insights there, um, Madam Esther uh, Ama Asante. Um, if you're still with us, we would like to have your final thoughts. On, uh, on the whole topic, the workshop. Um, please connect with your camera. Thank you. Okay, great. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, it has been a great uh, session here, and I enjoyed every bit of it. And I'm going to connect with some of you um, on the platform. Thank you. Um, I think what um, I would join what Joanna said, it's definitely up to us to tell our own story as Africans and rewrite it the way we have to because the experience, um, we, whatever we experience day in, day out, we have to put it there. And also it's only Africans that can build Africa 
uh, with the help of people who believe in us and trust us. Um, we don't expect anything uh, from anyone else, but we have to trust ourselves and partnership collaboration is, is the main key to, to make it. And I think also Africa shouldn't um, disappear from this new era of uh, digitization. We really need to impact um, our world and use this tool as the great opportunity um, to um, boost our economy and also um, develop our country and um, put in place systems that will help everyone and good governance in any way. Thank you. Mm, great points mentioned there. Um, I'm just going to read some comments as we have 60 seconds before we we head over to WA, where we are, um, you know, offered us a fantastic performance, a closing performance for this, um, for this, uh, you know, um, webinar, uh, which we have brought to you by the way of uh, the NDPC here in Accra. Um, we thank them very much for giving us, uh, you know, uh, their premises to run the show. Um, again, sincere apologies to all our viewers, especially those on YouTube who had issues with the live stream because, um, you know, we had complications in the beginning, but uh, the stream has been running smoothly for the past 90 minutes. And uh, of course, we um, we expect to improve in uh, our delivery of uh, the Ad Court, which is our annual flagship program uh, at the uh, Chamber for Tourism Industry um, Ghana. Remember, you can follow us uh, on social media at CTI Ghana. Uh, whether it's on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn, uh, follow us, or you can just look at look us up. Chamber for Tourism Industry Ghana. We are also on YouTube, as you know. Uh, so please subscribe. Make sure that you um, hit the bell button. A lot of uh, amazing things are coming up at the chamber. So do stay tuned as we collaborate with various entities, industry players, to make sure that um, tourism in Ghana and Africa uh, improves. Um, my name is Adai Kuya Asante, aka Triple A C O O at the Chamber for Tourism Industry Ghana. Um, and I was your host and moderator for both um, uh, the opening plenary session and the workshop. Uh, we're going to end with uh, a couple of uh, comments on a very positive note before I deliver to you. Uh, we are as amazing closing performance uh, done exclusively for CTI Ghana. So Solomon uh, Rataman is said, um, uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so many uh, comments coming in. Thank you for all the wonderful presentations. Very informative. Uh, Mr. Erika Pia, very insightful. We are very grateful. Uh, Mr. Bule, um, uh, this has been an awesome platform to get a sense of what's happening within the tourism space. A lot of learnings I've gained, which will definitely inform me as a social media and digital specialist in South Africa. Thanks to everyone who's been involved in setting this up. Uh, Mr. Edward Bruce Leal says, great submissions. Thanks everyone. The National Development Planning Commission is inviting you to join discussions on the future of work in post-COVID-19 Ghana on Wednesday, 26th of August at 5.30 p.m. GMT uh, at the Africa Trade House next to the British Council in Accra. Uh, and he gives the Zoom link in registration, you know, uh, for those who are participating in this Google webinar, you can have it. Um, other comments from Asravo Joshua, who says, God bless you all for the great impact. We also thank you and bless you. Um, Ada Tourism says, great insights from presenters, useful inputs to serve as tools to drive responsible domestic tourism as we strive to build back um, better. Let's make it count. On this note, we are going to make it count. Thank you all very much. We want to say big, big thanks to all distinguished speakers um, from the start to finish. Um, again, a massive thanks to Dr. Kojo Esem Mensa Abrampa, Director General at NDPC, um, Madam Abigail Adesna Olagbaye, African Tourism Board Ambassador and ex Miss Tourism Nigeria, who also filled in for her chairman um, at uh, African Tourism Board, who couldn't join us, but he did. A video for us which we will up put on us on our social media ch channels so please uh, do stay tuned uh, to hear his solidarity message uh, exclusively for us um, also 
uh, big thanks to Mr. Kusi Eyison, Tour Operators Union of Ghana President, Tuga President, and Ghana Tourism Federation Vice President, Gatov Vice President. Uh, big thanks as well to Mr. Bulut Bakshi, who joined us from Turkey. He's the president at the World Tourism Forum Institute and Global Tourism Forum. We will definitely be doing a lot of collaborations with him. Um, a massive thanks to Mr. Sol Molobi, whose uh, slides inspired many of us watching. Uh, Brand Hill Africa Chairman and former South African Consulate General to Italy. Um, merci aussi at, uh, to Anne-Sophie Ave, Honorable Anne-Sophie Ave, the French Ambassador to Ghana. Uh, many thanks to Honorable Dr. Ziblin Barry Edi, um, our guest speaker for the day and Deputy Minister for Tourism, Creative Arts and Culture of Ghana. We are so glad to have the support of MOTAC uh, at the Chamber. Um, and uh, again, uh, many thanks to Madam Beatrice Chaitel, who made sure that she will be able to have some input, even if she couldn't be with us live. She did contribute uh, via recorded uh, answers. Um, thank you to Mr. Fergus McLaren, uh, all the way from Canada, you know, time zones differences, and he still managed to uh, log in on time. Uh, it was 5 p.m. at his place, so very early. Uh, thanks again. Uh, thanks also to Madam Esther Ama Asanti, CEO of Organic Trade and Investments, for her wonderful insights. Um, and also, um, thank you to Madam Caroline Kimunto, uh, International Trade Center Associate Program Officer. It was great to have you all. Um, let me also share my um, you know, appreciation to Madam Joanna Diana Steele, uh, e commerce strategist, all the way from the UK. Uh, Mr. Simon uh, Alangde, CEO of Wine Buneloya Digital, and Mr. Yapare, whose brief uh, intervention was nonetheless very impactful. Remember, you can have his pictures on uh, his website, yapareimages.com, or again on his Facebook group. Um, and um, now the time has come to uh, just chill because you are going to really enjoy yourself in this uh, wonderful performance exclusively. Uh, by Wiala for us at the Chamber for Tourism uh, Industry Ghana. So let me just set this up for you to really enjoy it. We are uh, done here at the uh, at course webinar. We will be back next year, hopefully much bigger, much better, with no problems with the internet whatsoever. Thank you so much to all our viewers for your patience. And now it's time to enjoy ourselves. So let's take it away. Hi guys, welcome back. My name is Viala, AKA the Lioness of Africa. And my next song is actually called Africa. And it says, why do we fight when we have everything? Gold, diamond, everything. Uh, we shouldn't fight, we should use the energy in a positive way to make good use of all these natural resources to make Africa a beautiful and attractive continent. Everybody to want to come and visit. Here goes. The land is good, the land is fun. Go behind diamonds, we buy. Yet we find we cover it all in blood. Tell me why we are low in the mud. Africa, 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 yeah. Mama Africa, we cry for peace. Africa. The land is good, the land is fine. Yet we fall, we come on it all in blood. Tell me why we were low in the mud. Africa, 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 yeah. Mama Africa, we cry for peace. Africa. Some of them 
Thank you. 